Welcome. Holy moly, that's very loud. Welcome, everybody. We're here for the Startup Initiative. This is a uh, program that we are uh, running at uh, Intesa San Paulo and with the Innovation Center. Uh, this is a big part of our experience in early stage development, startup ecosystems, and innovation. And right now we bring to the stage immediately the uh, head of the financing of startups and growth, Luca Pagetti from the Innovation Center at Intesa San Paulo. Good afternoon. A warm welcome to everybody by Intesa San Paolo. Uh, I made a mistake. Uh, I'm joking. The welcome is from uh, Intesa San Paolo Innovation Center because uh, starting from March 2018, in Intesa San Paolo set up a, a brand new company fully dedicated to innovation, especially to the external innovation, not fintech, but uh, the innovation regarding all the industries of our clients. The base is in Turin of our uh, company, and our vision is uh, to turn innovation into a force of good. Many people, many companies are worried about the big, changing, the big changes that uh, the new technology, especially artificial intelligence, are bringing to our current world. And uh, we would like to have these changes in a positive wave to uh, let the companies grow and let the people live better. What is the mission of uh, the Innovation Center? We want to explore, we want to learn the new business models that are growing. Today we will talk about uh, uh, circular economy and uh, technology so that we can create uh, assets and skills for our customers and uh, make them uh, be more competitive on the long term. What is uh, the current moment? It's very interesting because uh, we had in the last few years some uh, public incentives and some uh, private intuition that uh, is bringing to Italy uh, interest into innovation and into the startup uh, ecosystem and environment. Yesterday I made a query on the database of MISE and there were more than 9,000 uh, startups registered and running. The SMEs uh, and there are so many high-tech SMEs uh, running uh, in our economy shown uh, a higher turnover to the average of the European competitors. This is a very good news. And uh, there is a good increase in investments to SMEs, uh, to startups, and uh, to open innovation. Maybe big corporations are coming to us to help, to ask help for finding uh, the right startups to develop their business. So innovation through connections, through match with the startups. We look over different industries and uh, we are focusing, starting with the new company, to the industries that are very important to our country. So you can see from fashion and design to automotive and mechanics, energy, building and construction, tourism, biotech, uh, healthcare. As you can know, Italy is one of the best countries in the world uh, in innovating uh, healthcare equipment. And uh, last but not least, uh, we are looking after innovation on agriculture, food and beverage. We are the second country in Europe uh, for production of uh, food and beverage and we have uh, to be uh, stronger in a, a very competitive world. What is the main activities that uh, are done within uh, the Innovation Center? First of all, we are uh, an antenna. We are seeking the know-how to understand uh, how the changes are happening and how fast they are happening. We have to distinguish the signals from uh, the noise. 
and uh, the signals bring to how to invest uh, quickly into the new technologies that are changing our world. We have uh, an activity, and this is the one that today is represented here, that uh, looks after the startup development. Startup need a uh, lot of things, not only capital, they need uh, business development opportunities, they need coaching, they need uh, uh, international scale-up opportunities, and we are setting, since uh, year 2009, opportunities to make them grow and to link uh, with the international ecosystem. The world of the startups is not uh, limited to a country. Their competition starts already into an international environment. We are helping our clients, especially the enterprise clients, uh, corporates, and uh, we have over 300,000 corporates clients uh, around Italy. Some of them are in very mature business, so they need uh, more help in quickly change their business model in order to compete for the future. And uh, at the end, uh, we also have uh, interest in developing the culture of innovation. It's very important for the bank, for the entrepreneurs, for the people. So innovation is uh, a new culture. We have to understand the new tools that will be available to develop the, the society in the future. All of those activities are made by different areas of the Innovation Center and uh, have impact in the bank, uh, in the bank clients community and uh, in the country as well. So at the end, uh, uh, we have uh, a dedicated workforce. Now we, have, we are around uh, 60 people, 60 professionals, up to 100, so we will increase in the next few years. We offer startup uh, acceleration and scale-up programs. We offer them finance as well, in debt and in equity. We have also a specific activity started uh, recently on funding uh, startups, but also SMEs and large corporation in investing on circular economy. It's a big change. It's a change of paradigm and they need uh, funding to support it. We also work with two uh, equity investment funds. One is Neva Venture, is the Intesa San Paolo Group Corporate Venture Capital. It's uh, it currently uh, committed 30 million and uh, will go up to 100 million in the next few years. They will invest mostly on fintech investments, so the corporate venture investment uh, requested by the bank, but also they are supporting uh, other industries that are using the financial instruments uh, made by the Innovation Center. Last but not least, uh, in recently, in the 1st of May, uh, the former fund of Intesa San Paolo uh, growth and become the bigger Italian fund by commitment. It's 130 million euro fund. It's called Indaco One. And uh, their main investors, it's uh, Intesa San Paolo and Fondazione Cariplo. They are already investing uh, from a long time to different technologies, in particular high-tech uh, uh, and uh, pharma, biotech, uh, and um, other uh, techs that will help and support our model of uh, innovation. That's it. I'm finishing and I'll leave this space to the next speaker. Thank you. All right, so now we bring, thank you, Luca. Thank you very much, and congratulations to Intesa San Paolo for this new spin out, essentially this new organization, the Innovation Center, which now has this mandate to develop uh, the innovative culture inside of Italy as well. To find out a little bit more about the outlook and the market trends specific to the food tech industry right now, we have Daniele Borghi, who also with Intesa San Paolo and the Innovation Center is looking into the research behind the, uh, the trends so that we can understand how to target as part of that antenna that Luca mentioned. 
the pathways that we need to get into for innovation to reach markets. Daniele, come on up. <laughs> Thank you, Luca. Thank you, Bill. Welcome, everybody. Uh, as I already mentioned, uh, I am one of the antenna of uh, the Innovation Center. Uh, my job is uh, to uh, understand, try to understand what's happening around the world, uh, not only or uh, in very uh, few parts uh, talking about the uh, financial sector, mainly for all the other industry sector that uh, we have uh, a look into. Um, we are applying in our analysis a model which have, we have refined during uh, uh, last years. Uh, here you can have uh, a, a very quick overview of it. We start from uh, the mega trends, uh, long lasting forces that uh, act uh, on the consumer ecosystem uh, and uh, in a more or less conscious way make uh, consumers change their habits, uh, their way of thinking uh, and uh, generates a new kind uh, of uh, of demand, the new products and new services. Uh, this demand has to be answered by industries. So uh, when you we look at the industry, we try to analyze uh, which are uh, not only the technology trends, uh, but how the market is changing, uh, which are the, the key players, uh, and uh, how things are moving. Uh, technology, technology is uh, the key enabler for all these kind of changes. Uh, going uh, uh, in a little bit, uh, uh, dive into the industry trends. Uh, here you uh, see represented uh, uh, the um, industry sector we are working on. Uh, here are classified uh, by a dimension, which is uh, uh, how uh, many funds, uh, the startups uh, are working in this kind of uh, sectors have collected during last year. Uh, here we, we have two dimensions. One is the total uh, venture capital funding uh, collected uh, during 2017, uh, and you can see that uh, uh, talking about food, uh, uh, there are more than uh, $5 billion collected by startups last year. Uh, and the other dimension is the number of deals. That gives you an idea of uh, how much is uh, uh, condensed or spread uh, this kind of investment among, uh, among startups. Uh, Let's have a look of uh, what's happening inside of the food. Here we have uh, uh, two kind of analysis, very quick analysis. One is uh, what's happening right now, so we will have uh, a, a look at uh, these uh, five trends. Uh, for each trend, uh, what's happening now, and uh, uh, what's, uh, I call it the what's coming next. So what we have to expect in the very close future. Uh, uh, five different views. The first one is uh, on the production side, so what's uh, happening uh, in the agriculture. Culture from, from a culture point of view, uh, a couple of uh, uh, interesting trends uh, talking about uh, the specific ingredients which are used in the in the food industry. Uh, what's changing the, in the distribution, is, uh, namely in the uh, retail sector, and finally uh, the rise of freedom food, which is a, a quite interesting new trend. So starting from the smart agriculture, uh, smart agriculture uh, is uh, something that we should better. Uh, uh, name as uh, uh, Farming 4.0. It's exactly like Industry 4.0. We have to start to look at uh, farming agriculture exactly as uh, an industry like manufacturing. There are uh, the same uh, technology which are right now applied in the farming and production sector. So we are talking about uh, um, uh, robots. Uh, uh, for the farming sector, we have to talk uh, uh, robots means uh, namely uh, agricultural robots, uh, we can, uh, uh, for, for example, uh, uh, seed or uh, uh, drones that uh, in autonomous way are able to spray pesticides or uh, fertilizer, but also sensor which uh, can uh, be connected to an, an IoT network to uh, uh, detect in real time what's happening uh, inside the, um, the, the ground, uh, or also IPEX spatial imaging techniques to analyze uh, what's happening uh, uh, in, in inside the salo from an area point of view. Uh, here you see a very short uh, overview of which are the, the, key, uh, the, the key technological sector where uh, funding, where investment are going. Uh, next, next, health ingredients. Health ingredients is one of the two uh, in interesting uh, trends that are happening that, that we are uh, having a look uh, in terms of uh, what is going to be produced. The first uh, uh, thing is uh, uh, there is a strong interest for uh, food, which is seen as uh, an uh, alternative uh, uh, response to the demand of uh, the uh, health. Uh, so not more uh, traditional medicine, not only traditional medicines, but uh, uh, among consumers, there is uh, um, 
uh, is spreading uh, um, uh, awareness that uh, also food can be a, a, an active actor in uh, being uh, well. And uh, there is a strong demand for uh, uh, the research uh, of ingredients which are targeting specific kind of uh, disease. For example, here we can talk about uh, osteoporosis or maculopathy, which are strictly, whose growth is strictly related uh, to the phenomenon of aging population. As you know, apart from uh, Africa, which is still a very young continent, for the rest of the world, uh, um, the average uh, um, age of people is uh, rapidly increasing and uh, this brings uh, not only positive uh, uh, effects uh, but also some problems namely related to some disease which is specific of, uh, of age. Uh, coming next, uh, this the consciousness that uh, uh, food can be uh, something that is related to the uh, healthy environment but not only healthy, also to the, the beauty, also to the wellness uh, generally speaking, uh, we, can, we are starting to, um, to uh, detect uh, a, a cooperation, uh, a matching between uh, the food uh, uh, sector and the beauty and fashion sector. Uh, there is a strict cooperation between two, so for example there are foods uh, which are uh, um, sold uh, inside uh, beauty store, uh, for example uh, this one, uh, HUM, uh, which is uh, starting to sell uh, some uh, vitamins, in, which are nutrition, these are vitamins but uh, are uh, sold uh, inside the Sephora retail stores, uh, and, and vice versa, there are some uh, uh, beauty products uh, that uh, are uh, advertised uh, containing healthy ingredients. For example, there is uh, a new uh, beauty uh, care uh, um, um, line of products uh, which is uh, uh, advertised as a uh, vegan uh, line. So uh, totally free, not only from uh, uh, animal ingredients, but also for everything which is uh, deriv derived from animals. For example, is uh, honey free or, uh, um, or, or any, uh, anything else which can be derived or produced by animals. Uh, second kind of ingredients uh, uh, are ingredients uh, extracted from plants, uh, but once again uh, are uh, strictly connected to the needs uh, to uh, care disease or to make people feel, uh, feel well. Um, there is a, a strong focus on uh, which are the therapeutic uh, um, uh, kind of uh, approaches that ca can be supported by uh, these ingredients. Uh, uh, here you can see a, a, a short list of one with, uh, with uh, which are the therapeutic areas they are uh, suited. Uh, at present, uh, Europe and North America are the key markets for this kind of ingredients, but China is growing quite rapidly, and in uh, three, four years, it will be the main uh, uh, market for this kind of, of products. Uh, in this uh, uh, arena, um, at present, there are uh, uh, vitamins which are extracted from uh, soy and uh, nut, but especially for, for nut, uh, uh, can be the risk of allergies for a lot of people. So now there is a, a research which is uh, w uh, looking at uh, pea, but not only pea, also mushroom and uh, seaweed, uh, like a new uh, sources to extract uh, um, protein from plants uh, and uh, embed them in a, a new kind of, uh, of uh, products of food. Um, the first trend, the transformation in food retails, uh, uh, um, food uh, is a product which uh, st uh, still see uh, strong resistance in uh, being uh, sold online. There are uh, new kind of new approaches uh, which are trying to change uh, this, uh, this uh, situation, uh, uh, namely new kind of a marketplace, uh, um, a new approach based on uh, gamification. Uh, but at present, the situation is uh, this one. Apart from uh, South Korea, in uh, most of uh, countries around the world, uh, uh, the penetration of uh, uh, online uh, uh, sale of uh, grocery products is uh, quite low, a uh, few percentage points. Uh, no difference between uh, uh, Eastern or Western countries, uh, which is the reason. More than 80% of people say they want to physically see and choose uh, groceries uh, before buying them. And uh, how uh, retailers are reacting, uh, here you see a few different samples. Uh, Walmart uh, 
is building up uh, a fleet of uh, drones uh, with uh, webcams uh, to show in real time to potential buyer uh, uh, which are the products they are going to choose from their uh, warehouses, uh, while Boxed uh, has developed uh, an uh, uh, augmented reality app uh, using which uh, the, the potential customer can, and at his own home, uh, have a uh, virtual representation of, of which is the product that he's going to buy. Uh, but in this sector, there are also uh, many different startups which are attacking some niche in order to provide a better user experience and uh, to streamline uh, the purchasing processes in order to facilitate uh, um, uh, the, um, this kind of, uh, uh, of uh, online buying that uh, still finds a lot of resistance. And uh, as a uh, last uh, trend is the rise of freedom food. Freedom food uh, is a phenomena that uh, is still uh, quite interesting because if we uh, think at last year, uh, uh, there was already 40% of uh, uh, food uh, sold, uh, which uh, was uh, somehow characterized by the uh, word freedom. Uh, freedom food derives directly from uh, uh, two uh, consumer trends that uh, uh, in uh, analysis that we are uh, performing right now are uh, quite uh, uh, rising uh, in, in a very interesting way. One is uh, the healthy and beauty relation and the second one is the ethical living. Both of them uh, bring uh, to uh, people be uh, strongly interested uh, to their own uh, wellness uh, but uh, uh, in connection with uh, an ethical behavior. So people are more and more uh, um, uh, attracted by brands and products uh, which have uh, characteristics that to be uh, ethical uh, produced. And one very important thing here is that uh, uh, all food, uh, the, the concept of uh, freedom uh, food is uh, means free, for example, from uh, animals, uh, vegan style, uh, or uh, based on uh, fair trade, so free from uh, exploitation of uh, working uh, uh, environment. Uh, everything uh, which is related to this, uh, this concept uh, is becoming a key uh, element uh, in, uh, for uh, uh, companies in order to sell their products. Uh, what we have to expect uh, here in uh, coming here, okay, one is uh, if we want no more uh, eat uh, uh, fish, uh, meat, or any kind of animals, uh, well, they are still animals, but is uh, a, a new proposal, uh, at least for uh, uh, European countries, and is not a, a new concept. Uh, more than one billion people eat uh, insects uh, around the world, but here there are some uh, new proposals uh, where uh, uh, this kind of food start to be presented uh, as a as snacks, uh, as uh, for example uh, chips. Uh, here you can have uh, cricks, which are uh, uh, sold uh, ch with uh, chili and garlic uh, or uh, bugs and uh, choco. And uh, uh, if you are uh, uh, among uh, the 50, more than 50% of people that at the present say, I will never uh, eat a, a, an insect in my life, uh, uh, okay, but think uh, uh, how can you find delicious uh, an oyster uh, or a snail uh, or uh, a frog? It's exactly the same thing. It's a matter of, uh, of mind. Uh, anyway, if you uh, don't are not going to eat insects, you have two other choices in a very few time. One is uh, synthetic fish. Synthetic fish uh, uh, is forecasted to be available for the market uh, next year. Or uh, if you prefer uh, uh, meat, you can, we, we will have uh, in a three, four years, uh, le meat which is grown in lab. So uh, the choice is up to you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Excellent, thank you very much, Daniele. Actually, it is interesting to hear that we're eating crickets out here and that some people are uh, behaving strangely when they try to eat a cricket with the idea that 80%, uh, as you said, of the uh, global population uses insects as part of their daily meal. And the average person in his lifetime will eat approximately 800 spiders while they sleep. So you've already started. It's no problem. Don't worry. So we heard a little bit about the trends, and certainly these are trends that are developing rapidly in some of these technologies that we will be not only seeing but consuming over the next couple of years. 
are interesting from a variety of different directions. One of those directions is circular. And so in that vein, we get to hear a little bit about the circular economy. The Ellen MacArthur Foundation uh, is now a, a big partner of Intesa São Paulo. Intesa has joined the Ellen MacArthur Foundation specifically to go after business models specific to circular economy. To hear a little bit about that, we'll bring up uh, Clementine Schoutenden from the Ellen MacArthur Foundation to tell us a little bit about what's happening in food and circular economy. Thank you. Good afternoon. So my name is Clementine. I'm the insight and analytic lead for the Ellen MacArthur Foundation. For the past four years of my life, I was living in Brussels. Brussels is the capital of Belgium. You all know it's also home to the European institution. But what you might not know is that Brussels is one of the most traffic jam city in Europe. As I joined the Ellen MacArthur Foundation just a few months ago, I got to relocate to Isle of Wight. The Isle of Wight is a small island south of Britain. It is a very small island, home to only 140,000 people. We are granted with beautiful landscape. It's a great place for nature lover. Half of the island is seen in a natural state, as a matter of fact. Um, so as you might imagine, transitioning from living in Brussels to living to the Isle of Wight was quite a shock. And traffic jam are just a distant memory. But I must admit that the best part of this transition has been about food. The island is granted with a very rich local family of fr local farmers. And I've been thoroughly enjoying preparing, hunting, and consuming this local food. As I moved from the city to the countryside, I reconnected with food. Unfortunately, not all of us will have the chance to live on the Isle of Wight or any place for that matter that can allow you to have access to local and fresh, healthy food. 60% of the world population will live in cities by 2050. So what's up with cities and food? How come did I not enjoy food the same way that I do now when I was living in Brussels? Undeniably, people are increasingly fascinated with food, and I'm sure you all agree with this. At the same time, citizens are fueling a race to the bottom when it comes to food prices. And I love this quote from Caroline Seale saying that basically that growing fascination stems from the fact that we are overwhelmingly disconnected with food, with the value of food and the meaning of it. Stemming from this disconnection is the fact that people don't really know what to consume anymore, whether it should be vegan, paleo, insects, or, or any other of the interesting trends that we've discussed already today. And it's also not a surprise that whole health-related issues to diets are on the rise. At the Ellen MacArthur, we believe that most of the situation stems from the fact that urban food systems are linear. So what I've got here for you is a simplified value chain to feed a city. You see that food gets transported into city after passing through several steps of the value chain, farming, obviously, but also food manufacturing. Each of these steps produce waste, industrial food waste or agricultural food waste. Once the food reaches the city, part of it is wasted even before reaching the consumer. And even for the food that is consumed, it will still produce waste, post-consumption waste. All of this creates a lot of waste in our cities, and our cities are becoming major concentrators of organic waste. If we were able to valorize all the organic waste that is piling in our cities, we would have enough to cover the global demand for fertilizer, not once, not twice, but almost three times. At the Ellen MacArthur Foundation, we believe in the power of circular model that are regenerative and restorative by design. A circular economy is based on three principles. First of all, we design out waste and pollution. Second of all, we keep produce and material in use for the longest time possible. And finally, we regenerate natural capital. We've been successfully applying this model for technical flows such as plastic and fiber fashion. If you're interested in the future of plastic, I encourage you to check the latest news of the foundation on the future of plastic. It's pretty amazing what we've achieved. 
what we've realized nowadays is that this model has a potential for food as well. So what does a circular model for food look like? Well, central to this model is the idea that we have to loop back organic and organic waste that are currently stockpiling in our cities. So as you might see from this schematic, um, there's three possible ways for nutrients and organics to be looped back. First of all, through farming, thanks to composting, but also new generation of fertilizer. Second of all, through later stages of the food manufacturing process, thanks to food innovation. And finally, nutrients that are piling up in cities can be used in the broader bioeconomy to be turned into biomaterials and bioenergy. By creating a process in which a city is able to get rid of the organic waste that is currently piling up and valorizing this waste, we would be able to create a regional ecosystem for nutrient recovery. This idea is actually not new, nor revolutionary. A long time ago, when scarcity was upon them, when time was harsh, people had realized the value of working in close organic cycles. And this is an example of a sewage farm in the UK in the 19th century. Whether we admit it or not, scarcity will soon be upon us. And one example of modern scarcity is topsoil erosion, a problem for which a circular model can help. So we are truly convinced that the value of working in a closed model should not be overlooked anymore. We're obviously not living in the 19th century anymore. And the enablers to allow a circular model for food are d fundamentally different from what they used to be back in the time. Um, we've identified here four pillars that we think are critical to enable a circular model for food. The first one is urban food production. If we were able to bring closer food production to consumption, to citizens, then we would allow a chance or maximize the chance for a local short loops of nutrients to happen. Pure waste streams, 20, 30 years ago, we've been asked to sort out plastics and glass from our trash so that we could upcycle those materials, recycle them. Well, the same holds true for organics. If we're not able to produce uncontaminated streams of organic waste, we cannot valorize it, we cannot reuse it. Advancement in reverse logistics. To create a circular model, you want to bring the end of a process to become the beginning of a new process, hence the need for reverse logistics. And the last one is policy framework. No strong circular model can live without a supporting policy framework. And then finally, technology and innovation are important enablers across the board. In the world of today, and thinking ahead of the challenges presented by climate change, resource depletion, and overpopulation, we are strongly believers that a circular model can bring multiple benefits along the line of economical benefits, but also social and environmental. Let's take the example of food resilience. If we're able to boost food production closer to cities, we are improving cities' ability to face food scarcity. If we're able to recover nutrients and then we use that to improve soil health, we're improving soil health and water availability. And then finally, by ma making people understand the value of food, whether it is pre or post consumption, and by bringing citizens closer to food production, we hope to reconnect them with food. And, and by reconnecting them with food, we also hope for a broader benefits to quality, uh, to quality of life for citizens worldwide. Circular economy is not just about fixing problems. I realize that I'm talking to an audience of startups and innovators and investors. Um, Victor Hugo used to say, if our gold is so much waste, on the other hand, how waste is so much gold? And that could not be more true today. One trillion foods wasted, one trillion worth of food is wasted every year. 800 million tons of organics thrown away in cities worldwide. This represents a tremendous opportunity for you innovators to capture, valorize, redistribute those flows, not only to make business, not only to make money, but also to alleviate natural resources pressure and create social benefits. 
In every crisis, there lies an opportunity, and I think we all agree that the time could not be more right for the food system to be disrupted by you all. As a matter of fact, the transition has already started, and I want to bring up a few examples. In the food industry, beer is now being brewed out of wasted bread. You could also have snacks that are created from agricultural byproducts. Looking at fertilizer, there's a new generation of fertilizer that are made of food scraps, not just composting, but something much more sophisticated. And then finally, in the field of biomaterials, clothes are being made out of orange peels and milk. So several startups have already realized the value of organic wastes and the value of a circular model for food. There are many opportunities for startups to bridge the gap between a wasteful linear system and a regenerative circular system. And my question to you today is, what role do you want to play in this transition? Thank you. All right, so we now have a chance to think about what's happening in the startups that we get to see here today. So we get to introduce to you a couple of people that we really appreciate. One of them is me. So I'm Bill Barber, and I'm going to be introducing my colleague Mauro Piloni, the former chief innovation officer from Whirlpool. We're going to bring him up in a few minutes. Before we do that, we want to uh, first appreciate the fact that he has worked with us on this. Many of the startups that we'll be presenting here today have learned an enormous amount by talking with Mauro, someone who has been on the uh, acquisition side of large corporates for about 20 years. And this is an important space. So we are here at this food tech showcase of some of the innovative projects that we see coming here out of Italy, out of Europe. And, uh, Agriculture and food technology is not new to me. In 1977, this is me uh, sitting in our family farm where we uh, actually ran a pretty circular economy type of activity. We grew most of our own food and where a baling wire that came off of this uh, bale of alfalfa became the uh, binding system for the fence post or even the bed of that truck, this was what we thought of as circular economy at that time. So it's not a new concept, but it's certainly one that has regenerated. And this is quite interesting that in that agricultural world, we have something that has a great history. Agriculture is not new. It was invented approximately 10,000 years ago, and technology was really the key driver, as this Egyptian plow indicates right here. That ag tech drove civilization. Really, this allowed us to specialize so that we could take on different tasks and ultimately stop our nomadic ways and get a chance to live together. And of course, when people like to live together, that means one thing. We can't grow food where people walk, so we have to think of different systems. So that system approach means that now we have to create food somewhere else. We have to bring it to where people are. So we grow it in centralized farms. We transport it using logistics and other systems in order to bring it into city centers. This has been our typical way of developing our civilizations. As we look at animal agriculture and dairy products, of course, we now don't just have a single family, a single cow family like I grew up in, where we had one cow to milk in the morning. But we look at how we can produce large quantities of produce and then deliver that back into the, uh, the cities where we want to live. So this is all driven by another resource that we know of that has to be in place in order for us to enable agriculture, and that's water. So we figured out a centralized way to deal with this as well. We create dams, and we use nice uh, long-distance transportation aqueducts. There's a few aqueducts even here in Italy, from what I understand. This is the California aqueduct, one that I'm very familiar with. And this has been driven, of course, through time over these industrial revolutions. So in 1800s, we had certain elements associated with the steam engine. Uh, the second industrial revolution in the 1900s then, of course, brought electricity, which allowed us to have lights, run 24-hour manufacturing, even uh, the types of manufacturing lines that Henry Ford was famous for. We had a digital revolution, of course, our friends Steve Jobs and Bill Gates here in their early days working together, of all things. 
And so this has then led to what we think of now as this next stage, this industry 4.0. So now technology is once again kind of pushing us in new directions. That's created some amazing results. I mean, think about this. We have achieved a 7 billion person population stream on the Earth. Pretty amazing when you think about that fact by itself, especially when only about 25% of the world is covered by land. And with that, we've got our food in centralized farms, we've got our water in centralized dams, and we've got electricity in power plants that now have uh, transmission lines. Awesome. It's a huge achievement. Give yourselves a big hand. But what could possibly go wrong at this point? So now we kind of think about, okay, we've got some security risks associated with some of these great achievements in food, in water, and in energy. When you think about it this way, in 1800, 98% of the population was growing some of its own food, 98%. And now we're looking at, in 2018, less than 2% is taking care of the other 98%. So we're dependent on 2% of the population to feed the other 98%. That's an interesting risk factor. When you think about this in the water systems as well, where we're centralizing water, delivering it, and electricity, the, the uh, electrical grids of Europe, the electrical grids of the US, these are high risk areas. And the population is not getting smaller, as we know, as we've heard over the last few days. We need 60 to 100% more food in the mouths of the people that are going to be on the planet in the next few years but 40% of the food that we grow today is wasted. We need a solution for this. And new economy zones, what do they want? Well, they want change, but they want meat. And we all know that we have a land mass issue. If only 20% or 25% of the world's uh, space is covered by land, we have a land math problem where we know that it's mathematically impossible to grow both people and cows at the current rate. So this is another big challenge that we have. In fact, as global challenges go, our biggest issue, although some people in today's political world seem to think that borders are a good idea, Global challenges have no borders. Our good news is that innovation has no borders. And this is part of what we're doing here today. We are the Intesa San Paolo Innovation Center. We run very specific programs to try to enable that innovation to reach the markets. In 2015, with the Expo program, we actually wrote a book on this. This is about food technologies, innovation, and sustainability. And with that, we looked at a variety of different projects that were associated with distributed manufacturing of final product. In this case, distributed manufacturing of vegetables at the point of use to be harvested at the moment of use, reducing the waste period inside of that. Another project, all of these out on the floor here today. These are companies that in 2015 presented with us at Expo 2015 have raised capital and are now moving from their concept phase into a deployment phase, so we're very excited for these companies. Revolution is out on the floor as well, creating olive oil at the point of use to be used at the moment of production. We have Malixia out on the, out on the, uh, out on the floor here today as well, looking at the security around the health of bees in beehives using IoT and remote management. Desalinator, the distributed production of fresh drinking water sitting in the place where you would actually produce, you would actually use. So once again, the point of use at the moment of use. So these distributed manufacturing technologies are some of the interesting thing that the technology that got us to the point we are today have an opportunity to drive us to the future as well. The Startup Initiative is a program. It's a program that we developed in California. We brought it into the European community. We have a variety of different projects that come through our technology program. So from digital to mobile to biotech, life science, medical device, health tech. And of course, we look at how those different technology megatrends, those different technology categories, affect industries like food technology, like we're here today, smart building and construction, fashion and design, automotive and transportation, a variety of different industrial outputs. Different countries, different stages. This is part of what we think of as our process 
which is essentially a series of activities that allows us to look at deal flow, prepare companies to get in front of the investment community to raise the capital they need, get global market feedback, ultimately leading to what we like to think of as the return on investment path, the ROI, which every investor is interested in, whether it's financial ROI, social ROI, enabling, whatever. So with that, we try to look at things that converge. No company on the stock exchange in any country comes from one technology. It's always a merger or a collision or an aggregation of technologies that leads to great value. With that in mind, we're looking for those convergence points. This is what the program accomplishes. And if we did it once, that would be good. If we did it multiple times, let's say in a category like clean tech, now we start to bring years and years of information, of entrepreneurs, of innovative projects together in a collision atmosphere, what we think of as a cyclotron type of acceleration program. But now if we bring in other technologies into that same cyclotron, this is where real value gets found. So we do this as a way to initiate the process, ultimately then to bring the different relationships that we have through the industrial connections of a large bank, bringing in technology, entrepreneurship, venture, debt investment, and then bring that into the industrial outputs. This is where we're trying to create the most value. This is the innovation center. Now in the room here today, we'll see a couple of presentations, seven to be exact. Those projects are companies at very different stages. So we say all are different, none are perfect. They come from a variety of different directions and there are different stages in their life cycle of entrepreneurship. You'll see presentations that'll be about 10 minutes long. Five minutes of Q&A, Mauro and I will lead that Q&A, but if someone has a question, they're welcome to raise their hand. We'll see if we can get to that as well. But this is not about only the presenter. We have brought you into the room and we're locking the doors to get your input. You will not escape. On each one of your chairs, you have an executive summary as well as some information about how to log into our opinion app. We want to capture your opinion. Your mobile phones are enabled to do so. It's as simple as this. The website that you'll go to on any browser, jedi.com, so G-E-D-I-H.com. On jedi.com, put in your email, and that is the email address that you received your invitation for this event. So if you received that email, or the, the invitation on that email, that will be your email address. To start with right now, if you have not registered before, your password will be 0000. And you can go in and change your password by clicking this button up in the top right, going to profile and change your password. If you've already registered in one of our other events, you use your existing password. If you have not entered through the registration process, you can always go to the bottom of the first page and set a new registration. Simple as that. We expect everyone in here to be participatory because we know we have the intelligence in the room to truly create some change. This is where entrepreneurs are able to receive from you the feedback that drives them towards the right direction. Pivoting and finding the right needs of the market is every entrepreneur's goal. And this is a great chance for us to contribute together to bring that to the table. So when you log in, you should see a page that looks uh, exactly like this. It will have the list of companies that are presenting here today. And with that list in the order of presenter, which it is, you can click on each one of those projects and you can contribute your data. Very simple, grab the little button and slide it where you want it to be. Zero is bad, 10 is good. So for each one of these concepts, and there's just basically six different sliders that you can uh, move from left to right, the idea is to capture your opinion. What is the overall project opinion on the, the entire project? What's the product or service value, the market opportunity, the competitive landscape, team, business model? And at the bottom of that second page, or as you're scrolling down, it says, I would like more information from this company. So if you want to hear from this company, click yes. Your email address will be delivered to achieve that communication. Now, if you have 
other resources that you can think of that you would like to contribute to this startup as they're presenting. This is a wonderful chance to type in what you think might be a good connection point. If you have comments, positive questions, or suggestions, I'd like to hear from, the, from you on those as well. So this is a great chance for all of us to be contributors in this Q&A today. Any questions on that? If you forget to hit the Save and Next button, we got you covered. We built it into the app. So we are the Innovation Center, and this is our program. And so we'll be doing the startup initiative. That's what, uh, that's what we're here to achieve. And we'll start with our first presenter that will be Mangrove. So Alessandro Villa, where are you? Alessandro, come on up. And Mauro Piloni, come up here with me. Mauro, come over here with me. We're going to sit sure. here and we have a chance to hear the presentations. And then, of course, we have a chance to ask questions of our presenters as well. And once again, if you have a question, we do have one extra microphone. We'll grab it. We'll bring it down to you. But we want to hear uh, what, we, what we have to learn from you today. Are you ready? Works. Works. Yes. All right. Alessandro, take it away. Okay. Good afternoon. Uh, really glad to be here to present to you the Nature Inspired system we developed. The mangrove technology platform is a means to build a profitable superfood farm on non-productive land. The mangrove technology platform, which we actually call the MTP, is uh, uh, aimed to solve one of the key societal challenges we are facing. Worldwide, uh, land degradation and water scarcity is the new mega trend. Uh, we produce 44% of our food on dry lands. We lose every year 12 million hectares due to land degradation. And uh, we estimate 66% decrease in water availability by 2050. Here, our solution, the MTP, basically profitable superfood farm on non-productive land. We can grow nutrient-rich food, uh, literally reconquering the graded soil. The MTP is a unique combination of engineering, uh, agronomy, and information technology. We produce uh, fresh water from salt water. We irrigate uh, organic uh, uh, bio-incubator, which are able to grow nutrient-rich food while regenerating the soil texture. We gather real-time data to optimize the production parameters. The MTP, um, include combined three key technology. The desalination unit uh, as optimization of the evaporation process run by the sunlight, uh, organic bioreactors uh, uh, made from specific fiber which enter in symbiotic cooperation with croup rods, and IoT devices as a scalable network of different sensors. Um, what we did uh, recently, uh, May 2017, we won the Dubai Expo Live 2020 Challenge, 100k Euro grant, and uh, December 2017, we won the European Horizon 2020 call for circular economy, about half million Euro grant. Uh, market opportunity, the MTP basically is a bankable solution for regenerative agriculture. According to the Ellen MacArthur Foundation, at least 70 billion US dollar will be invested by 2050 for fully regenerative agriculture practices. Moreover, according to a study recently published by Mirova, at least 7 billion US dollar has been raised only in 2016 for projects contributing to the land degradation neutrality. So land degradation neutrality thanks to regenerative agricultural practice, is our market sector. According to this definition, we defined our TIM on worldwide scale. We define our SAM with focus on uh, Mediterranean Sea and Middle East. And well, what, what is obtainable for our solution? According to the European Biodiversity Strategy, Every year, an average between 50 and 160 square kilometers are regenerated. And uh, we estimate to gain between 1 and 5% of this amount. 
market entry, we are going to finish the technology integration, technology readiness level next year. And next year, we are going to build our first large-scale facility in Tinos on a Greek island. We are going to finish our patent process by the end of this year with the aim to enter the market by mid of 2019. We therefore uh, well-defined four uh, potential client profiles, uh, the agritech company, the soil engineering consultancy, the real estate developer, and the public multi-utility. Uh, several entities supported us in developing the MTP. First of all, Ultrafab for the IoT devices and Plantasia for the organic bioincubators. Who believed in us, uh, where the money come from today, from Dubai and the European Commission. Uh, we uh, carried out a comparative analysis uh, with the three competitors according nine criteria, the three competitors, Sandrop Farms, uh, Sahara Forest Project, and Seawater Greenhouse. And well, the MTP has still to reach the technology readiness level nine, so for cereal production, and we have still to really enter the market. We have so far just one client, uh, Dubai Expo 2020, but the MTP show a clear uh, competitive advantage because it's the only solution able to regenerate soil while growing uh, food. And uh, moreover, the MTP allow gradual investment and is able to keep uh, OPEX and maintenance costs very low. Barrier to competition, the MTP is not a product, it's a system, it's a complex system which arise from the reverse engineering of biological system. And we are going to patent this unique combination by the end of the year. And entering the market by mid of 2019, we could uh, um, uh, join the market's uh, first mover and be appreciated as first mover. Moreover, we think that uh, the, real, the real competitive advantage uh, will be our attitude to continuously merge more and more technology into our platform. Uh, the team, myself, 10 year experience in business development, my uh, partner, Alessandro Bianciardi, environmental engineer, 20 year experience in, in environmental policy for the UN and the European Commission, Emiliano Repore, PhD, instructional engineer. And our main advisor, Marco Arcelli, former executive vice president of Enel Group. Financial um, uh, profitability of our client, uh, uh, one facility covering one hectare will require an investment of about half a million euro with yearly income 140,000 euro in front of OPEX maintenance cost of about 60,000 euros. So the MTP is able to achieve a ROI within six years. Our uh, financial plan in the next five years, we are selling, we will sell facility covering from three to 34 hectares per year with the revenue, a growing revenue from 1.4 to 14 million euro with a solid EBITDA of, of at least 50%. Investment opportunity, we already invested 320K uh, euro. We are going to invest additional half million euro thanks to the European grant by 2020. And we are looking for a precede investment for an additional half million uh, euro, offering uh, a simple agreement for uh, future equity with an attractive discount rate. As use of funds, we will use uh, how we are going to spend the money, 35% for business development, 30% uh, for R&D, 20% for M&A, and 50% for a try and buy facility. ROI strategy, by closing the first round, we are going to establish a NUCO, the mangrove NUCO, with the MTP as main asset. Uh, we don't need only money, we, we need uh, a clear, uh, significant, relevant introduction to specific investment fund, the five season ventures, the green climate fund, the climate investment fund, and the land degradation neutrality fund. The mangrove technology platform, time to evolve together. Thank you. All right, Alessandro, you have what looks like will become a 
kind of a project-based approach. So you'll build a plant. That plant will be one to two hectare in size, or it sounds like you have somewhere between one and 30 hectare size frame. How do you scale this up from the perspective of the number of different facilities that you can construct? Is this something that can be deployed quickly through project financing and then absorbed by a new buyer? Yeah, well, um, analyzing the competitors, we defined uh, an average say, size of the possible facility, which is between two and five hectares. Okay. Okay. And uh, basically, our competitors are, are able to deliver between two and four facilities per year. So okay. we, we just, how to say, simplified our business model emulating that. Okay. I do have a question on the competitor side. Yeah. Uh, how much of those competitors could become uh, partners in the future? Uh, okay, I, I mentioned the, the Sandrop Farm, which is based in Australia. They basically utilize a, a different technology, so a, a solar concentration technology, and in order to produce fresh water from salt water. So our technology could be combined uh, to basic in a, in a circular approach uh, to utilize uh, all the moisture they produce uh, to reconfigure new uh, fresh water. That's a good example. Uh, moreover, all this solution, all those solution utilize basically a hydroponic technology. So they, they really don't uh, uh, um, uh, uh, regenerate soil. So they don't uh, care about the soil. We do. So the biological products that you're producing deliver nutrients back into desertified soil. Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, what we call an organic incubator, which basically releases specific uh, ingredients, uh, so, which, which enter in symbiotic cooperation with the roots. And, and, and then the roots basically attract new vitality of the soil, and at the end you, you enhance the soil texture. But we don't, we don't regenerate in terms of uh, we, we, we are not able to regenerate polluted soil so from EV material or whatever. Okay. We regenerate uh, in seems that we announce the soil texture. Okay. And who is going to make the check if the soil is polluted or not? Are you taking that uh, yourself as well or, uh, or uh, not? Uh, you, you should consider that uh, our Customer profile is well defined, so the agritech company take care of that. But the agritech company will have uh, more choice to select our technology to introduce a specific project. Yeah. Now tell us about your test site, which is coming up in Dubai for yeah. the Expo in, 2020. Uh, 2020. So what uh, what does that look like? What what form does that take, and what kind of soil are you going into? It sounds like sand. Yeah. Well, uh, the, our, our uh, um, how to say, large-scale demonstrator will be in Tinos, which is a Greek island, because we are partner of this uh, circular economy project uh, granted by the European Commission. It's a uh, quite relevant project. It's a 12 million euro grant. We have a, a piece of that, and basically we will build a five technology platform on three island and the mangrove technology platform is one of the of the technology okay. platform very good for dubai answering your question we are uh, we are uh, basically thinking to to regenerate uh, urban gardening because otherwise very difficult to regenerate the sand difficult <laughs> to regenerate sand and it's probably <laughs> difficult to go out and see all right alessandro villa thank you very much this is mangrove okay. technology Okay, got it. Thank you. Bye bye. All right, so I remind each of you take a look at your app, go ahead and log into that mangrove uh, selection and slide your bars across to indicate your thoughts on what you think this project represents. We want to hear from you. Certainly, if you have a, uh, comments, questions, uh, suggestions, we want to hear those too, so type those in. You can use any uh, device you have mobile, phone, app or a tablet or a PC, whatever you've got with you. All right, we bring up our second presenter, which is uh, Bentour Spirogro. Now, where's Luca? Luca, come on up.
Good afternoon to everybody. Today we would like to present you Spiru Grow. Spiru Grow uh, is the first household appliance to produce uh, fresh spirulina. So fresh spirulina just pushing a button. This was the target when we developed and we started this company. Just uh, for the people who doesn't know spirulina, spirulina is a superfood. On 2008, uh, FAO elected the superfood of the year, and uh, he has a lot of characteristics, so it's full fill of protein. So if we are speaking about the dried one, that is the most famous in the market now, he has 60% of protein. He has a lot of calcium, iron, beta-carotene, and vitamin E. Like every food, fresh spirulina is better, but he has a limit. He has 24 hour shelf life. Because it's a fresh food, it's a live food. So we decide to develop uh, Spirugro. Okay? So Spirugro is a household appliance. I would like just to show you how uh, it works. We developed together with the University of Florence, and our first target was easy to use an automatization filter and uh, a production of 20 grams a day. So we have a glass vessel where we put uh, a starter. Starter is one liter of uh, fresh spirulina solution. We put inside the spirugro, that is a household appliance bioreactor. We switch on the lead. We have CO2, CO2 sorry, and uh, uh, the salt. And the equipment start the photosynthesis. After two days, you are able to collect every day 20 grams a day of fresh spirulina. That was our target. Everything starts uh, when I had the opportunity to visit a plant, production plant of uh, spirulina. And uh, during the production, they asked me if I would like to test uh, fresh spirulina be before they are going to dry. And uh, I was very curious, and my answer was yes. And when I tested, it was amazing. So from that moment, I started, uh, I say, I want every day at home. I start to look uh, uh, in internet if there was some opportunity or some equipment to produce it. There was something, frankly speaking, but it was quite complicated. And uh, for this reason, we decided to have this startup and uh, develop uh, uh, Spiro Grow. Sorry, I changed. This is an overview about the market. So the spirulina market is going to grow in the next year. This, in our opinion, are lower volume than the reality, but we buy this, this, uh, all these figures. So we re represent and we take our reference to uh, the company that give us. And the people who already use spirulina usually are vegetarian and vegan because you have all the amino acid inside the spirulina. So it's a very, very, important for this kind of uh, um, people who doesn't eat meat, but also for sporting people, because, uh, okay, they can integrate amino acid in a natural way. And there are many, many other uh, people who are going close to this kind of food for all its characteristic. Here, I would like to summarize you. There is one potential competitor that is come from France, is Algen Dieu, that is Bloom. I would like here just to uh, make some differentiation between us and them. So both of us, as inside light lead, we are air pump for the circulation. They choose to have a plastic tank. We choose to have a glass one, easy to use, easy to wash. We have inside the machine the filtration system that we see uh, before. And we have, in an automatic way, nutrition and CO2. Later on, uh, the advantages of spirulina is that uh, when it's fresh, have not bad smelling instead of the, the dried one. And uh, we decide to add uh, some flowers about this, which is the advantages of uh, the fresh spirulina. Fresh spirulina, you have not heavy metal inside. So with this, I mean, there is very good production all around the world, but there is also production that is in open tank close to the uh, industry area, and so some, sometimes uh, is also uh, contaminated by uh, heavy metal. 
Of course, like every food that we say in advance, uh, when it's fresh, it's better, due to the fact that it's high vitamin, high protein, and high nutrients. And uh, we already told it's a very, very uh, flat tasting. This is the reason that uh, we uh, provide okay, different option for the people to choose different uh, uh, flavor testing. Just a few technical information about the machine. Uh, we patent in December uh, 2017, okay, the bioreactor with the filtration system and all its parts. We uh, register also the brand, so Bentur, uh, with the payoff is already registered in Europe. Spiru Grow is already registered in Europe and we are going to uh, register in USA, Canada, and Mexico. And we also register the conversion of Spiru Grow in, uh, in China. Few words about our team. Uh, like I told in advance, we develop in collaboration with the University of Florence. So Mario Tredici with his spin-off Photosynthetic and Microbiologica is part uh, of, of our team. One of my best old friend, Marco Pazut, so he helped us to design and develop uh, uh, Spiru Grow. Mirko Dalabona is a PhD. Okay, Luca Turin, I'm here. Uh, Eli Regalado will help us for the Kickstarter campaign that we'll explain you later. Uh, Robert Florian was my old boss in the previous company where he was working for, and uh, he joined us uh, to help to develop. Luca Cesarato, that is CFO, and uh, Mario Prataviera, that is helping us a lot to reduce our bill of material, and so in the industrialization phase, together with Marco Pazut. Some names. Uh, EPS is a plastic module uh, company, who is, uh, will be also the uh, assembling line. We develop and design together with Due Pi Greco, another Italian company. I already mentioned Photosynthetic and Microbiologica, Studio De Peru for the um, logo, and we are based in the Polo Tecnologico of uh, uh, Pordenone. Generally this year, we take also part uh, to CS in Las Vegas, so we were part of the first delegation of the 20 startup. We give some numbers about uh, Bentur, Venture, we have 80,000 euro of share capital. We get from the bank uh, by loan, uh, one of them is also in San Paolo, thank you very much, 800,000 euro. We take some regional funding this year, and the next step is a Kickstarter at the end of May. We will declare a very small goal, 80,000 euro, but it will be higher, and this is also a way to test uh, the market. We add uh, in April uh, Horizon 2020, and we took 12 points. So we are going to present once again uh, in May with some correction and we hope to get better. And uh, also one other target is an ICO in Swiss at the end of July connected to the, to the Spiru Group. The first step to go to the market will be e-commerce by Kickstarter and later on on our web website. And as soon as the company will grow, uh, the intention is to develop a second brand, okay, so B2B uh, distribution line and also we received some requests from network marketing. To develop this uh, second phase and third phases, we need to raise more money and differentiate brand and kind of machine. Just an overview about the machine. So it will be available, uh, I speak price without VAT, so in this way it's easier to understand, is uh, 658 euro, okay, the machine. It will be lower on Kickstarter. We are nine euro uh, with the salt and the CO2, just to give you an idea, is the model of uh, uh, soda stream business, okay? So uh, it's the same, uh, the same one. What we are looking for, uh, in according to our business plan, to go to the market, we need 700,000 euro for the moment, just to uh, buy the material, get the stock, and investing also in marketing. And in according to bigger investment, there is different step, action plan to uh, invest more in marketing, and so, give the opportunity to grow faster to the company. Okay. Question now? I go first. Okay, I go first with the uh, first question. So now Mauro comes from a world of appliances and uh, uh, white goods. And, so and I'm going to start with a very tough question. Right. So your target is B2C to start. Yeah. And my doubt is the following. Today in our kitchen we have our floor full of stuff, toaster, juicer, coffee machines, 
how you are going to be able to gain space. Because in my opinion, your big issue will be, and your real competition is going to be the coffee maker, the toaster, to gain space uh, on the kitchen. Yeah, no, no. it's a photobioreactor, so get smaller is quite difficult. We decide to start to develop this uh, equipment uh, due to the fact uh, that, let me say, it was easier to start. Uh, but the next step of the company is to develop machinery, bigger machinery for restaurant, okay, because 20 grams a day is too low. And uh, also it's possible, for example, for offices. Okay, so you collect your spirulina before go hot home. And there is also an idea, but I say idea is a built-in appliance, okay? So I don't want to spend maybe more uh, word on that because uh, it's just a, a, an idea, but it's not uh, covered by any, any fact. Yeah, so you have a B to, a B to B approach in restaurants and office buildings. You've got a B to C approach for, for home, which may be potentially a built-in appliance at some point in the future to get yeah. away from the countertop fight. Okay. Yeah, I think it's only a question of number to reach that level. So Okay, so given that, what is your target market in this? Is Italy a target market for you from a country perspective? Is it somewhere else? Where is the, the ideal buyer? Or frankly speaking, I'm Italian. I'm very happy to be Italian. But for this kind of product, uh, I think uh, we love food in Italy. So when you're speaking about algae, there is very few people able to listen you or open to listen you. So the main market also, in according to the previous slide, is the United States. So last week we went to New York. We uh, make another company that is Bentur USA just to manage the Kickstarter campaign. So the main, uh, to answer you, the main market will be United States, Canada, UK, France, and Germany. And of course, I hope to sell a lot of this equipment also in Italy, but uh, in according to now, our business plan is not the main, uh, the okay, main market. Okay, so you still have a goal of bringing in distribution partners in those key markets as yeah, you move forward. for sure. All right, very good. Is, uh, is the patent covering uh, all those countries, so US uh, and all the European countries, or just Italy? We start with the Italian one to the European one, and within I I 30 months, we would like to implement the PTC. Okay, so in this way, if we found a big partner, we know his preferred market, and so we can choose, let me say, later on. All right, Luca Turin, nicely done. Thank you very much. This Thank is you. Spiro Grow. The company is Ben Tour, but also known as Spiro Grow. And of course, uh, both of the companies that have presented here this morning, uh, or this afternoon so far, are on uh, the floor downstairs with booths so that you have a chance to, uh, to be able to come and see them. All right, we bring up our third presenter. Uh, X Farm will be coming up to the stage, so let's bring up Matteo Donotti. Hey, everybody. Let's start. Whenever you're ready. Good afternoon to everybody. My name is Matteo Vanotti, and today I will speak to you about X Farm project. I used to be an engineer, but I'm a farmer too. And I know as farmer is, is difficult to manage a farm, it's complex. More and more today, where we have to manage a lot of data in a farm. So you have to, man to manage pesticide and also how to optimize them. You have to manage organic certification. So you have to track all your activities in a log or somewhere. You have to manage the weather forecast to organize your logistics. So a lot of aspects there is in a farm. And if we just take Italy, only 4% of them only 4% of the farm are using a digital platform. So everything is handled in a paper, managed by hands, so they don't use any digital platform to take advantage of that. But we believe that the data in agriculture are very important, and they can also get a great advantage of that. The, the issue is how to collect data. We solve, or we are trying to solve the issue, creating an integrating digital platform. You can see here, we create a farm management platform, so the software, where a farm can manage all the operational stuff and record them in an easy way. We create IoT sensors, so device able to collect data from the fields. We will see later how to then get the advantage of that. And we integrate services like irrigation, fertilization, drones, and so on, to have one unique platform to provide to the farm. Our market 
First market is Italy. We know the market, I am a farm, we know how it works. So we will focus in Italy to validate the model, the product, to be ready next year to move to other countries in Europe. Our main target is to go in Europe and to consolidate the product in two years. And our focus will be small and medium farms, as are the ones that need really a digitalization. Our key feature is simplicity. So software for farmers must be simple. I know my colleagues, they need something simple. If you give them something complex, their retention could be less than one day. They will not use more. And to demonstrate that we are simple, we try to have something objective. So with Polytechnic of Turin, we record, in average, how many clicks are needed to create a field, assign a crop, and record an activity on that field in the software. You can see that we use our platform needs less than 50% less than the average competitors in Europe and US. So we really focus in a software that is efficient and simple. To do that, we put together a team. There is me, a farmer, so I'm following the product. There is Salvatore, managing all the IT stuff with his team. We have Martino, developing IoT sensor. And we have Alain, that is an agronom. So different skills inside the team. We said it must be simple. To have a, a simple software, you have to work in user experience. So the software must be simple and easy to use. You can see here in the image, a PC from a tablet, tablet that the software is very visual. So no tables, nothing complex, visual. We send the software as today without any training and guide. So easy to use. And you can see here on the, um, on the mobile, you can see here that is moving. So with your finger, you can manage the full platform, starting uh, recording activities on the field. You can see your stocks in a very visual way. You can see the, the status of your product. You can see who take out and who bring the, the, the stock out. You can see all your tractors. You can record all the activities. You can have an adv alert when the maintenance is coming. You can see all your documents and so on. So from a mobile, you can manage all your farms. In, uh, for our user, 85% of all our farms are using the software from a mobile. So more and more, a mobile is present in a farm. Even in a more uh, older person, where a PC probably is not there, but everyone has a smartphone. As I say that we are a platform, so we, we don't have just a software, but we integrate services for agriculture, for farmers. And to do that, in a technical way, we create API, so we are able to interface different services in the market. Here are some examples. We integrate the land registry, means that in Italy you can see the full cadastro sheet with the numbers. That means that in an easy way you can design your farm knowing where are the fields, and so the activation is quite quick. Another example, we integrate satellite image. Uh, we apply all the filter like a uh, vegetarian, uh, um, you can see the status, let's say, of your crop directly from the satellite. We provide algorithms and advice to you. We integrate an irrigation service. Also that is provided by a third party startups. It's not us, so they have the competence, the competence how to do that. But we integrate with the same user experience in the same uh, platform. So we provide to the firm a unique platform that is even is easy and, uh, um, let's say, easy to use. You can see the screenshot here is the irrigation that we launched this week in Sydney Chips, so it will be available to all our, our user. We integrate professional weather. We integrate fertilization uh, services. We integrate tractor data. I don't go into details, but that is just to demonstrate how horizontal is the platform and can be really a unique service for a farm. We integrate clearly uh, data from drone that are really important as today. And we connect with the Italian uh, pesticide database, in future with the European one. So then all the data of the pesticide are already integrated into the system, and the farm does not need to input the data into the software. We are clearly working on the traceability of the food, as there are a lot of requests. And as we are able to collect uh, the data from the farmers from an operational point of view, then they can really get use this data also for the traceability of their product. We use, in this case, the blockchain technology to, to do that. So what is the result using a digital platform? You can save time, 
as from your mobile you can input all the data. You can reduce costs, so save money, uh, as you can optimize your water consumption and the pesticide use, and you can get advantage of your data, for example, for the traceability of your products. As said, we have also IoT device, so we integrate, we develop and integrate IoT sensors to collect data from the fields. And how to use the data? Data are nice, but the real return of the farm is alerting. So we collaborate with CREA, the Italian Institute of Agriculture, that provide us the algorithms to prevent illness, now on the rise on the wine art, and in an easy way, the farm can be alerted when this kind of illness are coming in their fields. In this way, they are able to optimize the use of pesticides. Here you can see the sensor that are in testing in a rice field. We are testing wine art fields since uh, six months. Our business model, so we have the basic package, basic package that is the software, so the farm management software with all the functionalities and this we give out for free. Our model is to give that for free as is already a value for us because we are in the farm, we are able to enter quickly in the farm we have the data of the farm, so we can already provide uh, advisory to them, and then we sell the services. So our income is on the services, like IoT sensor, irrigation, and so on. So our income will be selling services, internal uh, developed services or third-party services. We launched the, the beta in January this year. You can see here we have uh, about 1,000 farms inscribed in the in the platform and about uh, 10,000 10, hectares uh, registered in the tool and are distributed all across Italy. That was, is really interesting for us then to, to go experimental in different regions of Italy and different crops. Uh, costs are mainly developing of IT, uh, IoT sensor and marketing to, to penetrate in the market and the main income will be clearly selling uh, the services. Our operational break-even is foreseen uh, Q4 next year. We are looking now for a round as we get the first seed, and now we are looking for a first round of uh, 500K, mainly to push with marketing, so to penetrate in the market quickly. We believe that is a time-to-market project. We have to go quickly into the market, and we have to go on with development of the software and of the sensor. Interesting for an investor is that the, the exit that happened in the last months, so mainly done from seeds producer or tractor producer, that they bought farm management system as it was the way to interact better with their clients and to create fidelity with, the, uh, with their clients. So the market is quite hot, mainly in US, and we foreseen that will happen also in Europe. Thank you. Okay, first question. The space is very crowded. There are a lot of uh, solution. How are you going to differentiate yourself from uh, the competition? Yes, so as we said before, our key feature is simplicity. So we will push on that because we believe that the, the secret on this market is to be simple. So to really work on that, work a lot on user experience, and mainly push on the time to market. As we saw, the, the market is very fragmented, but is not yet taken. Only 4% are using something. So it's still to be taken, and we believe that the success is in time to market. So push really uh, hard on be fast. So with that, you have, you, know, you have a very interesting kind of complete package that allows a farmer to do lots of different things. It sounds yeah. complex because you have so many different horizontal uh, elements that you can tag in here. You've got a thousand farmers already on the system. Yep. How many of them use this every day? Are they yep. interacting with this on a daily basis or every other day or every week? What, is, what yeah. are you seeing from that test? I would say that about 10% are using daily. Okay. And in any case for us it's impressive because it's a beta version where there is no price written anywhere. So we are impressed that 10% of these farmers are using daily for a productive business. I would say 40% are using weekly, and then the other 50% is using probably because they are curious, they would like to try, so they are really in try testing, mode. Uh, testing yes. it. So you, you've got a thousand farmers now. It yep. sounds like that's pretty impressive for yes. early stage marketing. How many farm 
uh, targets do you have in Italy alone? You're starting with the Italian market and looking for yep. market domination here. How many targets do you have of small farmers in Italy? In Italy, there are about uh, 1.5 million of farmers, and uh, mainly the main of that are uh, small and medium farms, so probably 95% of them. And we hope to get 10% uh, of the market in uh, one year and a half. All right, so, so you've got uh, a million farm. and a half farmers yeah. to go after. 200,000 would be pretty good. Something, <laughs> <did>, yeah, <laughs> would be a pretty good. For number. that, we have to push on simplicity and time to market. That is really our. And main for that target. marketing, financing for marketing is your yes. key need. Yes, okay. that's the reason of the, the round that we are asking. Okay. On your uh, free version, yes. are you planning to create a business model uh, on the data? So I'm giving the free version to the farmers, but I'm understanding a lot from them and I'm going to sell the data to somebody? We are evaluating that as r the data are really important and uh, in two ways. First, uh, the farmer is the, own, the owner of the data. That is clear. But they can choose to sell data. So it's an, a, a way also for them or to pay less the service or to gain with, with the data. And uh, there are different uh, per, uh, counterparties involved, like uh, certificator, like uh, scientific uh, groups, and so on, that are really looking for this kind of data. So we will evaluate, but for sure, uh, we split in who would like to give the owner or who would like to, to profit of the data. I would yes. expect that data shared between farms, even if those farms are competitive, as uh, weather or, or uh, you know, a disease moves from crop yeah. to crop across from farm to farm, if they had some predictive data coming yes. from their neighbors, this could uh, benefit yeah. them as a whole as well. Is that Ar correct? Already we are doing that now with the, our scientific uh, collaborators, the university in Italy where the user can decide to participate in the pilot and share the data mainly from the sensor, so weather and disease and pesticide. So then oh, everyone can profit off the others. Okay, so yes. pathogen identification, whatever that might exactly. be. Exactly. Okay, yes. very good. All right, and going into the next country, where does that next country uh, look to be for you? You're starting in Italy, what's next? Next will be, so we will launch the product in Italy in August this year. And our next target will be Spain and France, that are similar culture to the Italy, similar size of farmer, so the next country, and then we'll move on in the, across the Europe. Okay, excellent. Any other questions? Maybe last question. Sure. How yep. are you going to protect your idea? So how to protect? We, we talk quite a lot on that. But we, at the end, we, we, we decide, let's say, that is really go fast in the market. So we are evaluating some patterns but we believe that success of this platform is the f f first is gain to the market is the winner. Okay, so Mat we are going pushing hard to be fast. Very yeah. good. Matteo Venotti, thank you very much. For thank you, everybody. All right, once again, I remind all of you to go back to your app. Go ahead and slide the bars across if you haven't already. If you have some suggestions, if you have resources that you think would be valuable, and you want to exchange those, certainly this is a great time and a great place to do that. We bring up our fourth presenter. So from Live Better, Chokino, comes Elena Luzzi. So, uh, good afternoon. Thanks for having me. My name is Elena, and I am the CEO and product architect of Live Better. Let's get started. One of the most highly traded commodity in the world is coffee. Coffee is number one hot drink in Western countries and number two globally. But why this crave for coffee? It's very simple. Coffee is the quintessential functional beverage. And the protagonist of its functionality is a little molecule called caffeine an addictive stimulant. However, there is a growing concern that drinking too many coffees might be unhealthy due to the common belief that it's the dose that makes the poison. Also, it's very interesting to note that younger generation are not that fond of coffee. If you compare the rate of people that don't, do not consume coffee between younger age group and older age group has more than doubled. 
younger generations has shifted mainly to tea. But what I found really interesting is that people that do not consume neither coffee nor tea has almost doubled. So what do these people drink? We might have an option. We created a very simple product. We took two natural ingredients, cacao powder and water. We mix it together and we obtain a ciocchino. Ciocchino is not only the launch of a new product, but it's the establishment of a new product category, cacao espresso. Ciocchino is served in an espresso cup and we define it as a blissful hot shot of pure cacao. Ciocchino is perfectly aligned with the major food trends of the global food and beverage industries. It's clean and clear label, low calories, organic, free from, naturally vegan and fair. Also a cup, um, no, well, why do we say that cacao is the new coffee? Because of another little molecule, this time called theobromine. Theobromine is a stimulant as caffeine, but um, it's pretty different from caffeine because it has a milder stimulation on the nervous system, its effect lasts longer, and it also provides a sense of well-being. So, if you have to choose a stimulant, theobromine is a gentler er, and easier to metabolize option. Also, in a, a cup of ciocchino comes with few awesome added benefits. And uh, this is the reason why cacao is defined as a superfood. And uh, this might be the reason why Linneo, a few centuries ago, named the plant Theobroma cacao, which means the food of the god. So let's now give a look at the market where, Cioc where Ciocchino position itself. Wellness. Wellness is one of the largest, most resilient, and fastest growing market, which has reached a value of 3.7 trillions, which equates to almost 5% of global GDP and 49% of global health expenditure. I find this number to be staggering. And uh, we, we need to understand that this number is only expected to grow because population is aging and every one of us wants to age healthy. So let's give a look to market potential. 6.6 billion cups are consumed every day in Italy out of home. Of these, almost 14% are coffee's alternative, barley, ginseng, and decaffeinated coffee. If we assume only 3% of this available market, it means the generation of 6.5 million euro. But let's give a closer look to numbers. We should achieve break-even at the end of Q1 next year, but what I would like to focus your attention on is the green spot on the graph. A very interesting 30% EBIT. Let's dive deeper. We are selling Ciocchino at 35 cents and it cost us only 3 cents, which means 90% margin and more than 1,000% markup. Our business model is built with, with all the major modern technologies in order to protect and preserve this margin. However, these are only numbers on an Excel spreadsheet. Let's now give a look at real numbers. We had a market test, which enabled us to understand which is the right type of customers where we should install our machines. But most of all, it validated the rate of consumption of Ciocchino which for the first year has been 10 cups per day, with a growth in the first month of the second year of 10%. And this was only a 70% cacao ciocchino, and it was not organic. Thus, it was much more difficult to communicate. Where are we now? We just installed the first machine, the first batch of production. These are some of our clients. They're very 
proud to have the new machine. It has been tough. This is Mario, our first ever client. And what is interesting about this machine is the fact that it is connected. So we know exactly where they are located. And also, we can see the consumption day by day. Uh, why this is important? Because our business model is to give the machine free of charge and then sell the powders. Having the machine connected to the internet enable us to create a closed system. Like this, we can guarantee our final customers that the product they are consuming is exactly the product we are advertising. So our machines will be able to operate only with our cacao. Our goal, <laughs> we want to install a thousand machines by the end of the year in Italy. Is this achievable? We are more than 300,000 possible customers. So yes, also we are under talks with three of the major Horeca players in Italy in order to close a partnership. And in Q3, we will start market tests in these countries. And for what concern our international strategy? We would like to close exclusivity deal with the major food service operator of each country. This will enable us to focus on the market we are really interested in, consumers. Uh, at, at every exhibition, people are telling us, wow, this is pretty cool, but how can you make Cecchino at home? So we have a pretty bold goal. We want to become the Nespresso of cacao, but absolutely capsule free because uh, there is no planet B. We are the first mover. This could be seen as bad, think MySpace, or good, think Red Bull. We have two patents, one on the machine and one on the process. But what I think is more important is our values. Live Better is a benefit corporation, a for-profit company which primary goal is to have a positive impact through the execution of its business. These are two examples of benefits corporation. But why this is important? Because of millennials. Millennials are the largest population, the largest generation in history. And what I found fascinating about them is that they identify best with brands which reflect their own values. And our values are naturally aligned with their values. So what are we looking for? Great people, of course, a lot of resources, a powerful network, but most important, we are looking for financial partners which share our vision. And which is this vision? Which is the reason why we exist? No. Uh, even, we, even though we acknowledge that profits are highly important, because they are the lifeblood of, of a company and also a measure of its impact, we want to make crystal clear that profits are not our primary goal. Live Better is a purpose-driven company, and the reason why we exist is to catalyze an industry shift, because we believe in a different future of the food and beverage industry, a future where food which is one of the most basic human need, as well as one of life's biggest pleasure, is tasty because we are biologically programmed to be attracted by what tastes is good, but most of all, healthy. Because food plays a crucial role in the determination of our health. Thus, if you are one of those type of investor who wants to generate value while also having an impact in the creation of a different future, we might be the startup you were looking for. With that said, let me invite you all to our booth, enjoy a ciocchino, and taste the future. A future where tasty means also healthy. Thank you. Thank you. So, Elena. This has been an exciting week for you. Yes. And certainly the idea of being uh, here at the Startup Initiative and specifically here at Seeds and Chips has offered you a unique opportunity. With many of the companies that have been presenting or presenting on the shop floor, 
They've had a lot of interaction with investors and potential partners. But we had a unique guest here uh, two days ago that was presenting uh, at the Seeds and Ships event, which was Howard Schultz, the, uh, the CEO and, uh, and owner of, of uh, Starbucks Coffee Incorporated. So you had a chance to meet with him, share some time with him individually, and give him a, uh, a demonstration of Chokino. What were the results? Uh, well, we had five minutes with our Schultz. He wanted to try Chokino, and he was really impressed by the product, which already for me is a great success because a man like this has seen everything. And he was so interested that he came to our booth and he wanted to see the machine and touch the cacao with his finger. He's a very human, very authentic man. So, um, and he said he was really interested and he wanted to know more. And we will see what will happen. But already it has been a huge recognition. Okay, very good. Congratulations on that. Okay, so the, one of the biggest challenge for Starbucks is the following. When they are making, when you are entering Starbucks uh, and you are asking for a sandwich, all this pay smell of sandwich, but they are a coffee company. So my question to you is, uh, how are you going to structure your value proposition with a Starbucks, with a company like that, that are creating their fortune on the coffee? Well, first of all, as we have seen from data, uh, people and younger generation, they want uh, multiple options. They, I think they get bored to always drink the same thing. And thus, uh, food services and in general the market should offer different type of products in order to fulfill the need of the market. And also there is a huge, huge amount of people that has never consumed coffee. I am one of them, but uh, during this adventure, we have met a lot of people with the same issue. And when this, they discovered Chokino, they were super happy that they finally had a product they could consume in bars or restaurants. So from a financial perspective, you know, the, a shot of coffee so a, an espresso shot has a certain amount of coffee bean grind associated with it. And from a cost perspective, uh, that has a cost that then rolls up to the profitability of these types of projects. For Chokino, what's the comparison? How does that look compared to a typical espresso shot? So it's really interesting. Can I have back the presentation, please? because uh, it's really interesting. We have amazing margins. At the beginning, I thought that the margins were lower compared to those of coffee, but in reality, they are way, way bigger. So here we are. Okay, uh, this is the price per cup. So organic coffee is 22 cents and normal coffee is 15 cents. The cost for roasters is seven cents for organic coffee and 33.5 uh, cents for normal coffee. So as you can see, the margin is way lower th than the margin we have and the markup way, way lower. Uh, also co uh, roasters in Italy, for example, they provide very expensive equipment to the cafe owners. And in Italy we have more than 700 roasteries. Uh, while for the moment we are the only one making a cacao espresso globally, so we have a pretty good competitive advantage. Okay, very good. All right, we have to stop right there. This is Chokino Elena Luzzi. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you very you. much. Thanks. And again, congratulations for what was clearly a, uh, a very interesting meeting for you with Howard Schultz, uh, very timely. So once again, I ask everyone to go to the app slide the bars across, give us your opinion, enter any data that you feel is appropriate, and we move to our next presentation. We'll give you a few seconds to work on that as you, uh, as you look through. All right, next up, Ambra Milani, come up here for Sinomis.
So, hello everybody. Um, <laughs> I'm here to present you Chinomis. Chinomis has developed an IoT tool for conscious and sustainable animal farming. Um, I'm not the first one today to tell you that uh, soon enough the world will be of m over 9 billion people. And these people will need to be fed, especially they will be asking for protein food. And uh, we know that uh, in business as usual, livestock farming is one of the most impactful uh, processes on the environment. In fact, it accounts for about 15% of greenhouse gases emission, just as much as transportation. On top of this, we also know that uh, uh, today the certification and laws uh, about animal welfare standards are becoming everywhere more and more severe. And uh, there's also a trend in consumers uh, who, asks, uh, for, who ask for more and more high quality food, traceable food, and especially regarding to animal derived products. In this global uh, landscape, we believe that the livestock sector has an incredible opportunity to shift its uh, ways of production to meet these challenges and uh, uh, become much less impactful. To do this though, they will need to be able to measure how they're doing. And uh, we see a little gap in the market there. In fact, we decided to develop Plinio, the stable kit. Plinio is a device that is deployed in the stable and uh, has uh, a way to measure all the major environmental parameters that affect animal welfare in each stable, no matter the kind of breed, no matter the animal that is farmed. Plinio will measure gases like ammonia, uh, methane, CO2, H2S, but also will help managing the whole farm while uh, measuring the water, electricity and forage consumption, and it will interact with uh, pre-existing equipment such as fans, heating and lighting. To do so, we use a single device connected, of course, to a cloud platform, and uh, the data sent to the platform is certified via blockchain <coughs> to be absolutely sure of what we're measuring. Uh, the, uh, the dashboard is extremely simple, and clearly it helps improving animal welfare, but at, at the same time, and thanks to this, helps the farmers to increase, increase the productivity of the farm. Uh, we know that uh, an estimate for uh, uh, the agri-tech global market around by 2020 is of over 20 billion, Euro, uh, 20 billion US dollars. Of uh, this incredibly thriving market, we want to take a good advantage and we want to expand our business far beyond national borders. Especially we believe that in the next five years, we will be dealing uh, with, uh, uh, we, 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 we will take our business uh, to Europe, China and Singapore, India, and far beyond it. We uh, will do so by targeting very specific customers, in particular, large livestock companies and uh, trade association uh, and to, to get to them, but also private and uh, uh, public control bodies and uh, also research institution. And last but not least, <coughs> small livestock farms. We don't want to target li small livestock farms at first because we want to be able to scale up very quickly and by doing so we would go much slower than what we want. We already have some customers. We are in the market and uh, we, our customers have in their stables so far around 25 devices. Uh, they are happily extending their uh, requests, their purchases, and we span across uh, the whole livestock sector. We have uh, dairy cows farm, uh, broilers and uh, laying hens farms, as well as sheep and goats. And we are very much looking forward into getting into pig farming as well. We do this not alone, of course. We have some technological partners and some uh, communication partners, in particular Vodafone IoT Italia, uh, who is sharing with us uh, their commercial network and allowing us to um, get to quite interesting and important customers in Italy. Uh, this is our competitive landscape. Of course, there are already uh, management uh, uh, devices and systems in the stable, 
But really, what we see is that ours is the only one that is completely suitable for all animal breeds. Uh, and it's also the very only one who allows to m measure multiple parameters within just one single device. Normally, what happens in the stable is that uh, different probes are deployed at different, uh, in different points of the stable, thus having to, shall we say, take care and deal with different uh, devices just to get the same measurements. Uh, also, we based our, uh, our measurement on animal welfare standards, and as I mentioned before, we certified our data. We are the only one who are based on IoT technology and are completely and fully customizable. So, just to say uh, once more what our competitive advantages are, we believe we are the next generation of animal farm management systems, and in doing so, we are the first in the market uh, being a completely IoT solution. Also, we are incredibly user-friendly, so much so that we actually send the device to the stables with no need for us to go and install them in the stable. Uh, and uh, yes, and last but not least, we are quite a lot cheaper than the, than the competition. This is us. Uh, it's three of us. Uh, we've been uh, uh, together for uh, the, whole, the whole path of Chinomis, Enrico, is our CEO, he is uh, the heart of the, of the idea. He deals with everything technical. Fabiana is uh, uh, our face towards uh, sales and uh, partners, and she's incredible at forging very lasting bonds with, uh, with them. Uh, Amra, this is me, uh, we're talking to, who's talking to you, and I deal with everything international. Uh, our timeline, we were born in April last year, uh, we, went, uh, we went to the market in January this year, um, and uh, today we are really in, uh, in looking to expand our business, and to do so, we will take part in trade events, especially in uh, uh, the Netherlands and in France in the next few months. This is our financial projections. We believe we will uh, reach the break-even point by mid-2020, and our revenue model is based on an annual fee as we, um, as we deal with a system as a service uh, sort, of, um, sort of model. Uh, our cost is quite contained and it's meant for a single device completed with all, with all the um, sensors that I mentioned before. We've been thinking a little bit about how we could uh, move on, move forward with Tsunamis, and we can imagine an acquisition by a tech IoT sensors company in the future, or by an agri-tech company wishing to expand uh, its offer. Or as well, why not, we are thinking about possibly uh, being uh, reach out to big data company, being able to sell the data we collect through these uh, devices. Uh, today, we are in seed stage, we are looking for fundings, we are looking for 550,000 euros we'll, uh, that will be mainly spent in marketing and sales. Um, we are also looking for other resources beyond capital in terms of an international advisory board, possibly with uh, experience in the Zotex sector from the public and uh, private uh, uh, point of view. So I'd like to finish with a quote from uh, one of our very <coughs> forward-looking customers who uh, recently said that uh, there is no future for those who say we've always done it that way. So let's change. And uh, thank you very much for listening. Thank you. Nice. Very good. Yeah, so Mauro, you have, uh, from your experience, you were involved in the early Nest project, which in some ways was assessing the er internal environments and then actively managing them. What, do you, what are your uh, thoughts here? Okay, the first uh, thought is um, that is an interesting space. I'm just asking myself, and this is the question for you, what is driving your value proposition? Is more um, the certification of the animal welfare or is more uh, the productivity for uh, your client? What is driving? Okay, I think if we talk to livestock corporates or uh, uh, even small farmers, we need to provide them with uh, the fact 
that uh, uh, en en enhancing animal welfare, you will get more productivity. This is scientifically proven. It's not us uh, thinking or wishing it, but actually we have uh, sound science telling us that if you keep animals in an optimal environment, they will grow healthier and faster. They will enter or exit the cycles of productions much quicker and uh, with a much higher profit. Well, this, this also sounds like, from what I mentioned earlier in my talk, this food security piece is a massive challenge. And certainly we saw some examples of this in the United States just a few weeks ago with the salmonella uh, outbreak and an E. coli outbreak even uh, just prior to that. Does this offer an opportunity for those regulatory uh, frameworks to benefit from this data from just a sheer food security perspective? Well, I believe so. If uh, I'm allowed to uh, expand on this, we've been contacted uh, by the Singapore Agri-Food and Veterinary Authority. Um, they outsource their meat uh, uh, intake, shall we say, and they go and import meat from their neighboring countries. Uh, doing so, they know that their neighboring countries have animal welfare standards much lower than uh, their own. So they, uh, in, uh, they send uh, technicians uh, to check the single farms. This is extremely time consuming and uh, uh, extremely less profitable. Uh, by using our solution, they would be able to control remotely and get an immediate feedback on what's happening in all those farms they are importing from. Okay. What is your uh, dream? Is, go is going to be the dream of uh, improving the animal welfare or is going to be the dream of owning and knowing how exactly the operations are happening? I think that really we need to shift our way of consuming meat. And this could drive the change. We could add value to the way meat is produced. And we could also reward the farmers for this added value. We believe strongly that farmers should be rewarded for the innovations they provide and implement in their, in their stables. Uh, so maybe less consumption of a higher quality product. I think we want to make a difference in that sense, help getting there. What is your international ambition right now? You have uh, some needs that you have in front of you right now, some financing. I would expect you also are looking for distribution channels in international markets. What is your, what is your need? Okay, so yes, absolutely so. We've already started moving um, in, uh, in an international um, landscape, so we've asked for example, for uh, some market uh, um, um, exploration uh, in Germany, uh, of which we know very little, so we really would need a channel to get in there because we know that it's one of the, mo of the biggest producers in, the, in Europe. Uh, we then wanna uh, move into France and Catalonia and then Spain, and we hope to find partners uh, at those trade shows that I mentioned before. I'm really looking, for I'm really looking forward to taking part to that. And uh, we've also started moving slow and small, very small steps uh, towards North America. This because we believe that it's a very uh, complicated market and we want to go there when we are ready and really um, uh, safe and sound to get there. Okay, so a little work before you jump into the larger yeah. markets there. Okay, very good. Ambra Milani, thank you very thank much. Thank you, thank you. Chenomis. And once again, I point you to your uh, app and to uh, putting your feedback in there. Certainly, if you have international connectivity and you want to communicate about that or communicate uh, back with Ambra, this is a chance to do so. So we move on to our sixth presenter of this session, and that is Crique. We bring in Eduardo Imparato. Come on up. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Eduardo Imparato, the director of Crique. Crique is a startup based in the UK that aims to introduce insects in our diet. We started the project thinking, how could we feed a population that will exceed 9 billion people by 2050, with a food demand that will increase by 50%, and with meat production that is expected to double as developing countries are imitating our eating habits. This is a massive problem, especially if we think that the um, livestock industry 
right now already accounts for 18% of global um, greenhouse gases emissions. And it already occupies 70% of all agricultural lands. So what are the solutions that we have? IPO suggests that insects are one of the most promising solutions and describe them as the food of the future. But why is that? Let's have a look at the water consumption. If we have a look at this graph, we can see to produce one kilo of beef, we need 22,000 liters of water. It's like having a shower for more than 24 hours. On the other side, to make one kilo of crickets, we need just 10 liters. Here is the land usage comparison, again, just for one kilo. And the greenhouse gas emission of crickets are just 1% of the one of cows. On the other side, regarding the protein content, critics uh, have uh, a protein content of 69%, while beef and poultry have 26 and 23, respectively. On top of that, crickets are rich in vitamin and minerals, like vitamin B12, that is the main concern from vegetarian and vegan. So what is blocking us to use this like superfood? Probably the idea of swallowing a, a giant cricket is not very attractive. But what, what if we consider eating crickets as something as familiar as eating a cracker? So our solution is to provide and to market a, a range of products with a familiar shape that has a 15% of cricket powder that enable us to increase the protein content of about 18, 100%, and the taste 100% delicious. So our main products are cricella. Cricella are cricket crackers, so a salty snack, a rich with a 15% of cricket powder, the final protein content is about 23%. Cricket biscuits are more an indulgent product, they will be the second uh, product on the market. And uh, I would like to point out there is, uh, crickets are not the only one, the only insect ingredient within these uh, biscuits, because there is also honey that is actually bee vomit. So we are used to it, and we will <laughs> used to be used to, to crickets. And the last product we want to uh, build on the market, um, take on the market is pasta that has the very same uh, texture of traditional pasta, while it has 19% uh, of protein. So we are not the only ones that are marketing uh, um, products made by insects. Uh, but um, given the fact that we use a familiar shape and uh, there is no uh, visible insect, enable us to differentiate ourselves and enable us to face a smaller cultural taboo. So on top of that, we have the highest protein content. We, uh, our, um, our products are ready to eat and uh, salty, so they are very easy to try for the first time. Th we don't need a cold chain, and we have access to high quality cricket powder thanks to our partnerships. So uh, the market opportunity, if we see the, um, the bigger um, the pie is uh, regarding the alternative protein market. It will, be, it will be worth 11 billion by 2021. The global size of the insect market will be 1.5 billion, thanks to a compound annual growth rate about 70%. So it's, it's a niche market, but it's increasing a lot. It's going very fast. The Europe market will be worth approximately half a billion, and we aim to attain uh, our obtainable market is uh, 6.3 billion million. How can we do that? We have to create a very strong brand identity and uh, our brand has to be uh, focused and based on uh, environmental sustainability. We want to promote uh, um, products that are both nutritionally balanced and super tasty. And our main audience is young professionals. I don't know what happened here. <laughs> anyway, uh, our uh, route to market started with, uh, in 2017 with a small, very small test. And, um, um, uh, sorry. <laughs> uh, 
uh, with a small online test that we made on our website. Uh, we will uh, restart the sales uh, more massively from next month. There will be also uh, independent retailers that will uh, uh, start to sell our products in the UK from next month. Um, we will all in, uh, in September uh, 2018, we will start to sell biscuits and pasta as well, not only the crackers. And by the end of 2018, we will start to sell in uh, UK chains. 2019 will be the year of uh, expansion in continental Europe, and we will also start to have uh, some flagship stores. The team is uh, composed by Marco, Francesco, and myself. Marco has been a professional chef and a restaurant manager for uh, 16 years. Francesco is a communication designer and uh, is caring about uh, the marketing uh, and the brand identity. And uh, I have a business background and I also work in a social enterprise accelerator. Regarding the financials, we have previously raised uh, 40 Ks and now we are asking for uh, 100 Ks. And we will use it mainly for uh, sales and marketing activities. And uh, we will all need also an help uh, for the distribution network from uh, our partner. So with this investment, we aim to have um, a revenue in 2020 around half, uh, half a million. But to, uh, to, um, to build a strong brand, we'll probably need more money. And so uh, we aim to have a bigger investment, half a million investment in 2019. And with that, we can exceed 1 million revenues in 2020. So possible ROI strategy are based on uh, possible exit with uh, Unilever, PepsiCo, are the very big companies, or with uh, Aspire Group that is uh, recently acquired Exo, that is another uh, insect company in the UK, in the US. So this is the first exit on the market, undisclosed amount, but it seems uh, to be very, very high. I would like to finish my presentation quoting the CEO of Pepsi, that said the otter's thing is eating crickets, and the other side, on the other side you can read uh, the feedback from one of our customers, and that is the most important thing for us. Thank you very much. Okay, nicely done, and I can say that I, uh, I took a package home to my yeah. family and had everyone in my family test it. We loved it, and so this Thank was actually uh, quite good. I think that it's interesting that we have this aversion to eating the crickets because, of course, the picture you show shows the entire body of the animal. Now, yeah. I don't know any of you. Have you ever eaten a cow while you're staring <laughs> the cow in the face? And I would say probably not. So this is... Uh, you know, really a conversion of mentality just based around producing food the way we would normally produce uh, animal products. So you, you convert it into something that's less yeah. personal. Uh, so from that perspective, the question that you have in front of you as you're building your brand is, are you selling a cricket-based product as the novelty of the insect uh, as, a, as a protein source, or is this truly a functional food that looks at the protein opportunity as being a, a you know something different than a carb based or a carbohydrate based cracker based you know so yeah, yeah. this almost sounds more like a functional food pathway as opposed to just the novelty of insects versus something else yeah it's a functional food uh, you can like we could also call it a superfood without mentioning the insects as well but actually uh, we think that it is interesting uh, right now for the first years to say that there are insects is very distinguished, uh, enable us to distinguish from the other competitors, especially if uh, we still don't know where uh, retailers will, uh, will place our, our boxes. So I don't know if it will be in the, um, in the crackers uh, compound or uh, in other, um, somewhere else. So anyway, we, we have to differentiate ourselves. And uh, we were um, uh, following what uh, is called uh, the purple cow um, style uh, marketing. So trying to differentiate ourselves as, uh, as much as possible. Of course, crickets are, uh, and our products are not a product that is for everyone. It's like a product that you love it or hate it. There is no, 
no gray zone, and uh, yes, it's a functional product, but for the moment we all also want to say that uh, there are insects in it. Okay. So I have to admit that I tested as well, <laughs> so all the families, and uh, it is really very good, uh, I have to admit. But I do have a doubt that is the following. How are you going to protect? Is there a secret recipe? Or here maybe in the room there is somebody with 20 million and uh, in two minutes is going to create a croquet mm -hmm. and then you are out okay. of the market. How are you going to protect? Okay. Right now I don't think that are uh, like a big food companies that have 20 millions or like uh, on the desk uh, uh, would like to uh, risk to jeopardize the reputation to like right now it's a niche product is a niche market so right now I don't think they will uh, will be able to to risk that much and to to, to launch a product on this uh, segment on the other side uh, there are like a lot of small startups that are uh, like um, growing up uh, and burn uh, and no every day, so there is a new one, not every day, but uh, like a lot. So the, mm, I think we have to scale very fast. So we started very lean and we are still very lean, but we have to scale fast. So is this meaning that one potential path is a strategic partnership with the big companies where also. maybe you can be, you know, the first step uh, without compromising the brand? Uh, yeah, yeah, I think it, uh, it could be a, a very interesting part and uh, like uh, speaking with uh, a big food company from the beginning and uh, let's say agree to a possible exit uh, in the future will be very interesting. So we will use our brand, uh, we will grow it. Uh, they don't risk their reputation if everything goes well. We have a deal that uh, make uh, both parties uh, happy. Yeah, I would agree that the larger companies right now would probably not take the early mm -hmm. position in this market because, okay, maybe it's brand risk for the larger organization. Mm -hmm. So they'll wait until there are some big players that have created good penetration with the brand and have customer loyalty. They'll be acquiring mm -hmm. those companies. So along those lines, that means that you are in the brand building business. Yeah. So yeah. with that, you have some early investment that is seeding the initial phases of your development and launch. Uh, but I would say that you will need significantly more capital to get that larger brand loyalty. Are you open to the potential that your funding could go from 500K to 20 yeah. million <laughs> in capital financing to build the level of a brand that yeah. would be required for large acquisition? Yeah, to go to the masses, we need uh, like a lot of capital. Right now, as I want, uh, we, we are starting with uh, promoting ourselves uh, uh, in uh, local communities that are very open to our products and are able to amplify our voice because they str strongly believe in our values and uh, in our brand. And, uh, yeah, but brand. yeah, to reach the mass, you have to use cash and... Uh, yeah, the brand that you have, I think, is very interesting. It's attractive. It's cute. Thank it's uh, it's got some good uh, some good position to it. So, financing the growth of that brand will be a key yeah. piece of your future. All right. Okay. Other questions? All right. We stop right thank there. Thank you very Lardo, much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Trique. And I. He does have a uh, product out on the uh, floor out here in his booth. So if uh, I don't know if they're uh, still available for testing, but if you are brave and looking to do that, you have a chance to, uh, to test the criquet. Uh, I'll again point you to the app. Please put in your, uh, your thoughts on the, uh, on the sliders there as well as the text box. We want to hear from you. All right, we bring up our seventh presenter, Matteo Cunial. Come on up here for Hydroplan. <laughs> So good afternoon, everybody. My name is Matteo Cugnale, and I'm CEO and co-founder of Hydroplan. First of all, because before going into presentation, let me say once again thank you to Intesa San Paolo for this great opportunity to be here to present our company in front, in front of you. Uh, so let's start with some, some facts. Hello? Uh -huh. Try again. No, it's yeah. green. Not working. Try again. 
just a second. A second said. technical problems on. <laughs> Uh, you can uh, dance. <laughs> you <Yeah>. can. Uh, <laughs> una barzelletta. So when you are in front on stage, uh, you have always to think about if those kind of things are happening, <laughs> how I'm going to gain time. So okay. in my former life in uh, Whirlpool, I used just to uh, make some jokes <laughs> and to gain uh, time in that way. So okay, always think, learned. always think about that. <laughs> Be prepared. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Let's see. Okay. So first fact: irrigation agriculture is the first cause of, of water consumption globally. And is there anyone who knows how many Gardas Lake are used every year for irrigation? <laughs> Twenty-five Gardas Lake are used every year for irrigation in agriculture, which is a huge amount of water. And the dramatic fact is that 40% of this water is wasted due to over-irrigation and old irrigation systems. Moreover, the FAO says us that we need 30% additional water by 2030 due to increasing population. Unfortunately, we do not have this much amount of water. We as Hydroplan, our vision, our mission is to guarantee long-term sustainability to intense agriculture while enhancing product and quality and yields thanks to input optimization. And to reach our vision, we built a software as a service solution that provide farmers with actionable suggestion on irrigation by gathering data from the field through a proprietary network of sensors. So key element number one, actionable suggestion. We are able to say to the farmers, the field number one needs to be irrigated in three days with a really specific amount of water, 20 millimeters. How can we do this? We studied specific water stress thresholds that are based on soil texture, crops, and growth period, of course, the season of the years. The second key element of our actionable suggestions is our capability to forecast the number of missing days before the minimum threshold of water content in re is reached, leveraging machine learning algorithms. The third element is the ability to understand the right amount of water to moisturize. That, of course, depends on the soil texture. Key element number two is the proprietary network of sensors. A field needs several data points to be correctly characterized due to soil spatial variability, sorry, of soil texture and crop. And to do this, we build a multi-op network based on RF technology. What does it mean, RF technology? It means that the whole network is offline and there is only one central gateway which is connected to the internet through GSM in this, in this case. In addition, our network is unique because of our energy management system. Our nodes in the field does not require solar panels, which means are super easy to install, no, uh, are super small, and there, there are no problems for farmers for uh, related to a mechanized operation. And we presented a patent on this solar, uh, on this energy management system that basically consider that we, our node uh, last two years with two uh, steel batteries, two uh, uh, batteries. RF technology, no solar panel, means a different constructor. Here we have prepared a comparison uh, for a 25 hectares configuration for the hardware cost compared to our competitors. And you can see that our hardware cost more or less, more, more than a half less than our, than our competitor. And this is super important for farmers because farmers have low margin per, per hectare. Irrigation management systems have a huge market opportunity estimated in uh, 15 billion euros worldwide. Uh, the main part, of course, is Asia, but Europe is a super interesting market because it's really concentrated in Italy and Spain, higher than 60% of total Europe market. 
and our market ambition is more or less uh, 150 million by penetrating a 50% market of Western, Western countries, so Europe and North America. Huge market, of course, we know that we are not alone. There are competitors, uh, several weather station players, which are more consolidated, and other startups that are working on irrigation management systems, but the two key elements that differentiated us be, um, in compared to the, to the others are the two elements that I explained you before. So the, our capability uh, to provide farmers with actionable suggestion and the way we have built our uh, network to gather data, which I remember you is, is patented. Our market anti strategy, uh, this is um, what we are doing right now. Uh, because we are active, mm, we will see later that we, will, we have a thousand of hectares mapped right now. Our market entry is based on Italian vineyards. Italian because of its relative importance uh, in the European market and vineyards because they have the highest operating margins. They are experiencing exponential growth rate. So think for example to the Prosecco cooperatives and they are used to in-field technology more than other, than other farmers. Our service model that we are using is based on a main pillar, which is two weeks from orders to installation. So basically, a farmer calls us today, and in two weeks, uh, he will have the system installed in, in the field. Uh, we have differentiated our uh, service offer based on uh, client size uh, with a mix of a direct hydroplan team for the installation and the service and uh, lo uh, local partners. So for example, distributors of irrigation systems. Our current revenue model. Uh, as I said before, we are a software as a service company. Uh, so we provide for free our nodes and we are asking a fee for the setup, so for the, for the installation and a recurring fee. Uh, so basically the farmer will pay a, a recurring fee, of course, uh, every year uh, per each node uh, installed. And within this fee, uh, the farmers pay uh, the software utilization, the weekly report, and also the, the maintenance of the, of the whole system. Ma this market entry strategy and this business model brings us to the base case scenario. Uh, so this base case scenario is built for Italian vineyards. Our ambition is to uh, reach 8% uh, of the market by 2022. Break even will be reached in the first half of 2020 with 600, 600 farmers. This is super important. Our product is currently running on 1,000 hectares on uh, with about 25 clients and they are paying clients they are not uh, there for free we sold our system to them we have fields from zero to 600 meters above sea level uh, so large varieties of of situation we have 10 different varieties of grapes and three different irrigation methods our team uh, we are currently five persons. Uh, there is me, uh, Francesco, me. I have a two years experience in uh, McKinsey and Company, and I came from. Uh, I have my family owns uh, owns a farm. Uh, there are Francesco and Simone, which are the core uh, technical team of our of our company. Both have a PhD, Francesco in sensors and learning system, and Simone in communication engineering. Alessandro uh, is our COO, and he has also an experience of two years in Ernst & Young. And there is Federica. Uh, she is uh, the first farmer that, have test, uh, that has tested our uh, product the last summer, and also made an investment, a seed investment in our in our company. And we are supported by uh, three uh, super advisors. Matteo, which is currently the CEO of Get UK, and has a strong expertise in strategy. There is Guglielmo, which is now involved in restructuring business and has an expertise in operation. He was a VP uh, of uh, Pirelli and CEO of Sogefi. And then we have Enrico, uh, which is a tech investor and expert of, uh, of finance. Key milestones from August, uh, we launched our first pilot in uh, July and August 2017 with Federica and we reached 27% of the, 
of water saved, which is a tremendous result if you consider last summer, which was super, super drought. We won the Sarcap Lombardia, present our application for the patent in November, and then we received also our C first proceed uh, round investment of 100,025 uh, 100, uh, euros. And now we are active on a thousand of hectares in all the northeast, uh, northeast Italy. Moving forward, uh, we are going in the super short term to integrate our solution with uh, pest monitoring, uh, which basically means that we are going to tell the farmers not only about the irrigation, but also the disease of the, of the winery, so to offer a 360 solution for winery health. And we are tuning, we are going to tune our model, our algorithms for additional two crops. We are already working with the University of Bologna for apple trees, and we are extending it uh, to other uh, fruit trees. And then in the future, we are going to insert other thematic packages and integrate other data sources as satellite images or data from, from tractors. Market, from the market point of view, we are going to enter Italy and then consolidate in 2018, as I said, for wine yards and then for apple producers, and then we are going to move uh, international. So first France and Spain and US and then, uh, and then Asia and South, and South America. To do all this, uh, of course, we need your help, and we, need, uh, we are looking for a seed investment of uh, 400,000 euros, and that we will use mainly for product development, as I said before, tuning of the model for two additional crops, uh, integration of pest uh, uh, monitoring models, and development of a self-service installation product, and the other majority of the investment will be used to uh, acquire first 150 uh, winyards, so 150 clients. Thank you again for your time. Here are my contacts, so open for, for question. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, the first question is um, around the system. No? I think this idea to manage the power that mm -hmm. allows you to um, reduce the complexity of the node and makes you competitive in terms of uh, cost positioning. I think this is going to be crucial in two aspects. One, I believe you may have um, other application of the power management systems beyond and above what you're doing. So the first question is, are you considering that or not? And the second question is, what is going to happen if you are not getting the patent? Okay, so uh, for the first part of the question, uh, yes, we thought also other uh, type of application. Uh, our uh, consultants suggest not only to make the patent for the agriculture system, but also consider for uh, monitoring uh, long pipes uh, for oil and energy companies. Uh, so that right now uh, they are using, basically send people there uh, to control pipes and sure. that's it. So they suggest us to apply also uh, for, so to consider also this kind of sector. So the patent is, uh, is not limited to the, agriculture, to the agriculture sector. And then, uh, but on the other side, the second part of the question is um, our key differentiation between our competitors is not uh, the network of nodes, is the ability to say field number one needs to be irrigated in three days with 20 millimeters of water. So basically uh, it's really not important the way we are gathering data uh, because probably in five years from now it will come uh, another way to gather data that costs 10 times less hours, but there and when it will happen, we will still be able to say, you need to irrigate field number one in three days with 20 millimeters of water. So I would say that our core uh, competitive advantage is related to our capability to say this kind of suggestion to farmer. All right, so yeah. in that same vein, in the same thinking, you have this opportunity to create a relationship with these farmers that on a daily basis or every other day that they're going to be touching your software to, uh, to receive some type of advice. Right now, from the data that you have, you said 
savings in water, 26, yeah. 27 percent? Yeah, 27, yeah. On a financial basis, what does that mean to a farmer who uh, has just paid 200 euros per unit and pays 200 euro euros per year? What kind of payback does that does that achieve okay. for them that, that gives them a financial decision that I need this, I, uh, it's definitely worth the investment? Okay, for our first pilot, uh, the payback period was less than a year. Uh, consider that the system would have cost uh, more or less uh, 1,500 euros to monitor that field. And the um, energy saving that the farmer was able to achieve with this 27 percent less water was 2,000 euro in only one month and a half of usage. Of course, it depends a lot on the, a lot of, on the type of uh, irrigation system that they are using and also the way they are um, gathering water for the irrigation system. Okay, but that's but just the water savings by itself. So if yeah. someone pays 1,200, 1,500 euros to buy, they save 2,000 in a year, it pays for itself. But yeah, I exactly. would expect that the big savings or the big uh, opportunity is the results of your production if you're more efficiently providing nutrition, water, et cetera, to your, to your plants. You get a better production? Yeah, exactly. You get a better production. Uh, right now, we do not have do not have the metrics on this, but we are building with our uh, customer right now. So we are doing um, comparative uh, tests. So part of the field irrigated according to hydroplan suggestion, part of the field not, in order to have this kind of metrics. Uh, but yeah, last year was a too short time period. Okay, understood. So you're at the beginning of those tests. But to me, yeah. what this product and maybe what answers your question as well, Mauro, is you know what beyond the technology uh, protectability do you have and really what what it looks like you have the opportunities to create a loyal farmer base that will be touching your application every day and that has great implications for demographic information specific to these farms especially if you're in specific uh, categories like wine yeah consider that uh, also to, to build upon your comment consider that currently our farmers are um, visiting using our dashboard uh, three times daily. So three they are using day. really every day to check weather forecast, to check if the uh, uh, water is enough in the field, so if the crop is stressed or not. So they are using really with a, with a certain frequency. All right, with the number of farmers available to something like this, that seems... Uh I have my last question for you is the following. In Italy, unfortunately, I have yeah. to say, we are seeing more and more a situation where um, staff are stolen, right, in the field. Yeah. What is going to happen if your uh, nodes are stolen? Do you have an insurance? Are you yeah, providing, insurance, are you providing back uh, the installation free of charge? No, we have an insurance. It happened. It happened for one of our customers, they stole one node and uh, he paid the cost of the hardware, so basically an insurance, and we sent him back the node and he was able to install himself. The is, node. is each one of these pieces of hardware geotagged? I mean, would you, would you know where it is and know where it goes? Uh, actually not, because uh, GPS module consumes a lot of energy, so <laughs> <laughs> we do not have. What was a okay, the trade off for lower choice, cost. Of course, yeah. yeah. Okay. Very good. Very All good. right, we stop right there. Matteo, thank you very much. Okay, thank you again. Genial. Okay, this was Hydroplan, and of course, this was our last presenter for our uh, technology session. So now we have a chance to really think about uh, awards, and those awards are actually independent of the presentations that you've seen here today, but we want to bring up onto the, uh, onto the stage. Max Tellini, where is Max? Is Max in here? And as well, Clementine, it's Clementine uh, Schutenden, you can come on up here and we'll talk about the Ellen MacArthur Circular Economy Award that uh, we have an opportunity to deliver today. I think we need some. All right, first we can exit the stage for this and we, uh, we move on. Oh, I'm sorry, we have Daria. Or Tomasi. Not All right, we get to... <laughs> um, 
My apologies. We have a chance to hear from Experientia, and we hear a little bit about uh, design thinking and design in food technologies as well. So please, take it away. Hopefully I can go next. Mm, not working for me too. Worked. So we're here to talk about uh, experience design and why experience design is so important when you're having a startup or when you're doing something today in uh, so many fields. We are uh, uh, an, ex an experience and service design company. We are an, won a lot of awards during the years. Uh, we've been on the market for um, 13 years. And from 2017, we are the main partner in all the experience and service design uh, uh, projects uh, of Intesa San Paolo. What we do, we understand behaviors and we try to design solutions that's, that matter. How we do it, we focus on research, so we do assessment and research is on users, customers, and so on. We do both service design and interaction design and we try to uh, deploy solutions uh, alone or with uh, software or uh, IT partners, test them and see how the go-to-market goes. We do it with uh, adapting a methodology, which is the double diamond methodology de developed by the British Design Council in a, in a unique way. Uh, we, st we try to start with an understanding phase. We try to understand how people, how users uh, really think, how they, uh, how, what are their values uh, and so on. And before going to the design phase as fast as we can, we try to model, we try to understand user behaviors and create the, the real context, the actual context for uh, the products uh, or the services we are delivering. We believe, mainly we believe in one thing, that the key challenge for all our projects uh, is uh, understanding behaviors uh, and drive through behavioral change. We think that behaviors of people must change with the products and the services we develop and really I try to go as fast as I can because I want you to see what we did for the, for the food market uh, in the previous years uh, in uh, many projects with startups uh, or uh, well-known organizations. Now I sh shift to Daria, who's here to explain two of our projects and what are the main key points uh, of what we did in the, in the previous years uh, in, uh, as a case study. Thanks, Tommaso. Uh, I'm going to present uh, quite briefly uh, two examples of what we did in the past. Okay, the first case is a project we did for a producer, ex producer in China. Uh, what we did was to help uh, uh, this company to uh, reposition its brand because they wanted to shift from selling products to selling services. So what we did was to start by looking at their users, their potential customers. Uh, we uh, actually try to um, understand their behavior, purchasing behavior, but also consumption behavior, working on fields. So we go on field, we interview real people, we observe them to uh, really understand the why behind their behavior. Uh, what we did in practice was to try to translate the insights we gathered uh, directly into prototypes. So we move fast from research to practice and we started to develop these prototypes. Here you can see something we did. Um, we work on their brand or their, on their image, uh, brand image, and uh, uh, for example in this case we develop a new packaging for them, uh, trying to connect their identity with uh, uh, the local community. So here we work with uh, including local artists' uh, work on their packaging. Then we uh, try to develop some new services. In this case, is a food box, uh, eggs box uh, delivery scheme for a special occasion as a present. Um, and then you can see some scenarios we developed. So we try to look at the entire journey of their customers, uh, looking at the in-shop experience, re the retail experience, but also the experience at home and uh, also the switch from offline to online experience. Uh, the three main uh, points uh, we want to highlight in this case are that we work on, uh, with an ecosystem approach. So we involve not just users in the research, but we involve uh, all the stakeholders, so not just people from the company, but 
from, uh, let's say, all of the um, supply chain. Um, then, as I said before, uh, we always uh, work with a qualitative approach in the research, uh, understanding, as I said, the why behind the, the what. Uh, and we uh, try to uh, pass from uh, insights to concepts and prototype in a fast way and iterative way using an approach that is well known as a, a design thinking, even if it can be called in different ways. Uh, the second case is uh, um, a food accelerator. We were asked by a Chinese foundation to help them in setting up the first uh, food accelerator in Taiwan. Uh, we work on two different, uh, um, let's say, streams. On one hand, we help them in uh, outlining the space for this accelerator. And on the other hand, we work on creating uh, two curriculum for startups. Um, in this case, it was a, a real co-design process with this foundation, very intense. And uh, we wanted to develop, uh, uh, let's say, an innovative space connecting uh, um, practice-based activities and theory. The three main points in this case are that we Engage, wanted to engage people over time, so we wanted to offer not just courses for a startup, but a space where they can actually come back in order to enlarge their network, for example, or being a, a becoming coach for other startups, maybe. Um, seed to market space, it means that we try to create a space not just for experimenting in production, uh, but also to experiment uh, uh, in uh, selling these products to the local community. And then, uh, as I said, we wanted to um, craft a curriculum uh, focused on hands-on activities. And we focused on four different uh, topics uh, that are business, UX design, food innovation, and entrepreneurship. So what we got from these experiences, but also for, uh, from, uh, uh, let's say, other uh, projects, uh, we got uh, eight principles that we want to share with the startups that are still here <laughs> um, related to food innovation. So things uh, that uh, should be taken in mind while developing products and services related to uh, food. Uh, the first one is to keep always customers close. So to uh, involve people in all the steps uh, uh, of the development of your idea. The second one is to look for behaviors, not numbers. So try to understand not just what is happening, but why and how. The third one is to uh, look at the entire journey of your customer, because in this way you can recognize where gaps are, where opportunities are, and also pain points. And you can try to solve these issues or get this opportunity with your offering. Uh, then uh, think uh, in terms of systems. So try to understand your system, how it's connected with others, where are the overlappings, and uh, where you can find uh, opportunities to collaborate maybe with other systems. Then hack experiences, not technologies. It means uh, uh, start with thinking about the problems you want to solve, uh, and not with implementation of a specific technology. So the technology is something that you have to use to solve problems, not the starting point. Uh, unify food and wellness means that for, uh, um, let's say, a significant part of your users, uh, probably uh, food is also related to wellness. So think in an holistic way when you propose uh, your product to customers. Then transparency, Tra we spoke uh, about, uh, I mean, you spoke about data before, for example, the, manage the management of the data you collect from farmers. Uh, this, I think, has to um, be taken into account also in terms of transparency. Uh, that is something that people look uh, more and more uh, with uh, great attention, let's say, in choosing what services and products they use and buy. 
And then uh, uh, a final point is related to the um, visual quality of what you sell. So food is more and more uh, sold uh, online through e-commerce and uh, uh, people are increasingly making visually immediate decisions. So also this aspect is very important in uh, the market today. Thank you very much. Everybody disappears. I don't know <laughs> who has to speak right now. I'll take it, I'll take it from here, thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, Daria and Tommaso. Thank you very much from Experientia. This is a, you are an Intesa San Paolo partner now as well, right? So this is uh, very nice to have you in the family. So thank you. Thank you. All right, we'll take this. And we do have uh, an additional speaker coming up from the Future Food Institute. Come on up. All right, we'll give you this. Thank you. Hi everybody, I'm Claudia. Uh, I'm speaking on behalf of Future Food Institute, that is an international non-profit organization, leader in food innovation, and we are partner of this uh, amazing event of uh, Banca Intesa San Paolo Innovation Center. So today we will deliver the Future Food Award to one of the startups that applied to startup initiative. Uh, and uh, I'm gonna tell you the story in the framework of which this mm, prize will be delivered. So, um, the story is uh, the one of the biggest uh, world tour. In just three days, uh, we are gonna realize uh, the Food Innovation Global Mission. From May to Helve, to July to Helve, we will be in two health food tech hubs uh, in 10 different countries uh, with a delegation of 16 researchers from Food Innovation Program. That is uh, our master. We realize every year in cooperation with the University of Modena and Reggio Emilia and with the Institute for the Future of Palo Alto. So we will be in uh, Europe, Amsterdam, Madrid, Berlin, we will be in the United States, in Canada, in Asia, Tokyo, um, Shanghai, Bangkok, Hong Kong. So why are we doing this uh, amazing journey? Uh, first, because we believe that uh, education is the most powerful weapon uh, to change the world. And food innovation, of course, uh, has an amazing impact uh, on uh, climate change, on environment, uh, on economic, on economic at an economic level and for society. Our food innovation program, as I said before, is a 12-month second level university master. We use uh, an holistic approach for food innovation because we believe that it is the only one uh, uh, required for the nature of food innovation. And uh, the program rests on design thinking, cross-pollination, prototyping and teamwork. So, the Food Innovation Global Mission is the second phase of this program that starts with uh, inspiration, with uh, lessons so with our academic partners like Stanford University, UC Davis, uh, Poly U in Hong Kong, Wageningen in Netherlands, so basically the best uh, academic partners we could uh, find uh, uh, all over the world. Then there is the aspiration phase, and the last one is preparation, because mm, our researchers uh, uh, will be inside the R&D divisions of corporation for the tra technological transfer of all the knowledge we are going to learn uh, during this uh, uh, global mission. So this is a very life-changing experience. Uh, and. Uh, after the global mission, uh, we will publish four books, uh, one uh, for each main topic of the mission. And during the mission, we will meet uh, five different targets uh, of organizations and people. The first one is uh, institutions and governments. I'm the head of institutional relations for, food for Future Food Institute. 
So uh, we believe that food innovation is also a matter of policy. Just think about the food policies uh, that we need in the planet uh, to feed the growing population. The second main target uh, is uh, composed by startups uh, and companies because of course food innovation is a strategic leverage for competitiveness of companies. Then we will meet universities and research centers because of course food innovation is a matter of science and research. We will meet uh, media, journalists, uh, influencers, opinion leaders because we need uh, to speak more about food innovation and to improve uh, the awareness uh, about the power of food innovation. And then we will meet uh, climate leaders. Uh, I was trained by Al Gore, the Nobel Prize for Peace uh, and former Vice President of the United States uh, in Pittsburgh. And I personally became a climate leader. We are to help thousand climate leaders from 136 countries. So Climate Reality Project, Europe branch, India branch, and Canada branch are supporting our global mission to stress the importance of food innovation for fixing climate change. So we will meet climate leaders. Uh, 25 climate leaders uh, are available uh, to meet us and give climate presentation during, during this big uh, uh, journey. So speaking about uh, the topics of the mission, uh, we have four main topics. The first one is the future of proteins. Uh, we need to find solutions uh, for uh, alternative source of proteins. Uh, indeed, uh, uh, meat production at present is contributed between 15 and 24 of total current greenhouse gases uh, emissions. Uh, we need to understand what is the future of proteins for feeding us and uh, for having an impact on the planet. The second topic is agro-innovation in smart cities. We all know that uh, more than 50% of the world population's population lives in urban areas. Uh, and this figure is expecting to reach 66% by 2050. So the main challenge, uh, of course, is uh, how to feed uh, these people uh, in urban areas in a sustainable way. Indoor farming, as well as vertical and hydroponic technologies, are just some of existing possible technologies used in different ways around the world. So we're gonna we will find uh, solutions uh, to satisfy this need. Then we have the future of food services, because of course food is increasingly becoming part of an unforgettable experience and customers are always looking for a deeper relation between food eaten and health impact. Last but not least uh, topic uh, that is important also for the other partner of this uh, startup initiative, that is the uh, Ellen MacArthur Foundation, is scalable sustainability and circular systems. So we are required not having a uh, um, linear value creation model. We need uh, to uh, think circular. We need to think to waste as a resource also for other production cycles. And that's why we will study uh, about circular system during our global mission. So uh, during the global mission, we will run a very massive social campaign that is called Future Food for Climate Change. We will have hundreds of advocates, and all of you, as you are very sensitive to uh, the issue of future food and climate change, I hope, can actually become our advocates, just answering to our call and uh, post on social media conversation about future food and climate change. We will run uh, more than to have digital meetups uh, during this uh, social campaign. Uh, that means uh, moments where sharing this conversation and being connected with our delegation around the world. For instance, one digital meetup will be during the hackathon in Rome 
on food waste, we are going to organize on May 25. Another one will be the hackathon with Tim and Olivetti that we are going to organize uh, on June 7. And also the Climate Reality Project uh, Algor's training will represent a digital meetup for us. DOT Academy Bootcamp will be a digital meetup. And on June the 1st, the mayor of Taranto, that sadly is known to be one of the most polluted cities in Europe, we realize a digital meetup because they will meet the mayor of Pittsburgh uh, that represent a role model for the transition to a green economy. And I'm very proud of about this meeting that I organized in the framework of my climate actions. Because I, as I mentioned before, I studied in Pittsburgh and I met Bill Peduto. So these are the targets I already mentioned. Mm, and I, I'm sure that here we have companies, startups, uh, organizations. So all of you can be involved uh, in our global mission. We can discuss uh, about legs where you want to come to visit us. Uh, this is the institutional agenda. This is the parallel agenda I will uh, be uh, responsible for. As you can see, it's a very uh, tough job, but uh, very interesting because we will meet uh, ambassadors. We will meet uh, United Nations Agency for Developing Countries the nine agencies in charge for this very important issue. And uh, today, as you all should know, is uh, Europe Day. So happy Europe Day, everybody. We like to feel uh, uh, European ambassador in a certain way during our global mission. So I just want to give you some examples of our legs starting from uh, Europe. The first one is in Wageningen in Netherlands. We will be there with the United Nations as we are launching the third edition of International Award for Innovative Ideas and Technologies on Agribusiness. Imagine that in the last two editions, Unido ITPO Italy has already recollected more than uh, 500 projects coming from more than 200 countries. These are uh, very technological projects that can actually have a positive impact uh, on developing countries' economies. We will be at European Parliament uh, with Paolo De Castro and Elena Gentile, and we will discuss with them uh, about uh, food policies and how Future Food Institute can contribute uh, technically to these policies. And then let's come to our uh, main issue. This is the Future Food Award. One of the startup uh, we are going uh, uh, to, uh, to deliver our award will have the opportunity to come with us uh, in Madrid and in Berlin. In particular, we will be in Madrid on May 23 because we are uh, launching uh, and there will be the opening of our Future Food Lab at the Ed Innovation um, Center. So uh, the startup uh, the that will win uh, the Future Food Award will have the chance uh, to present uh, uh, their idea to our Spain business community. Then this startup can have the chance to participate at uh, our event in Berlin on May 24 uh, at the Italian Embassy. So on that occasion, one of you can have the chance to present their uh, business model, their uh, innovative idea to our German business community. Then keeping speaking about Europe, we will be in New York to meet uh, the European Union delegation and all the member state delegates. Uh, the same will happen in Bangkok. So this is uh, the invitation at the opening of the Future Food uh, uh, Lab in Madrid. And then these are the, uh, the others uh, uh, legs of the mission. 
uh, there is in particular Hong Kong because we have decided to deliver the Future Food Award to one startup uh, that uh, distinguished for uh, traceability and food security. This is very important to us because we are going to open a branch in Hong Kong where of course this issue is very, very important. We already have uh, um, an agreement with the MA of the Alibaba Group in Hong Kong. We already have an agreement with the Italian Chamber of Commerce in, in Hong Kong. And we are going to sign an agreement with Invest Hong Kong. So we think that's why we have chosen that issue in particular. Food Innovation Global Mission is just one activity um, that we realized uh, as a Future Food Institute uh, in the framework of the education asset. But we are also in charge for Open Innovation Program. We have Valerio Pappalardo here, that uh, is the Open Innovation Manager of Future Food Institute, uh, and he will deliver the, the um, award. And then we have uh, the community asset with hackathons uh, and the uh, promotional uh, events. Uh, this is uh, our seeds of disruption map uh, that stresses uh, the holistic approach that we have uh, by innovate uh, all the food the supply and the food chain. So the question, of course, uh, is uh, if not us, uh, who will uh, fix climate change and uh, work uh, to, for, to, to shape uh, a better future? And if not now, when? That's it. Thank you. Hey, Claudia, thank you very much. Let me steal that from you as well. All right. Excellent. Now we bring up our award uh, presenters here for the first award, which is our Circular Economy Award. So now we bring up, uh, we want to bring Clementine uh, Schutteden back up to the stage and from the Ellen MacArthur Foundation. And we bring Max Tallini as well up to the stage from Intesa San Paolo. We'll give you some microphones here to work with. One there and another one here. Max, if you want to take that one. All right. And we'll let you guys take it away. Please go ahead. So I'm really pleased uh, to offer this award on behalf of the Ellen MacArthur Foundation. Um, so this award is basically a membership to our Emerging Innovator Program. Um, by receiving this award, the selected startup will become part of our C100 member, uh, which is a network of more than 115 organizations, corporates, government, and universities. Um, and for the program, several benefits will be uh, offered. One of them is obviously the chance to build a unique network but also accessing business education program, lead and participate in co-projects with industry leaders, and finally make use of Cello, which is our matchmaking digital platform. Um, yeah, so okay. maybe Max. Yeah, so the, the winner is uh, uh, Exagro Urban Farming, so please come on the stage. <laughs> Intesa San Paolo Innovation Center and the Ellen MacArthur Foundation are pleased to nominate Exagro Urban Farming as the winner of the Circular Economy Award for its commitment to accelerate the transition toward the circular economy. Urban farming and aeroponic technology are the frontiers in innovation to face the challenges in the current food system. Thanks to the implementation of biomimicry design principle, Principles, Exagro can be a regenerative solution to decentralize food production, enhance its supply chain, and increase food quality within cities. Thank you very much. For you. Let me, of course, congratulate uh, Exagro. I actually think that we will have something to do together in the near future. And of course, thank to Clementine for joining us from the Lemecato Foundation. We at Intesa San Paolo proudly support what this uh, uh, network is doing. The Mercato Foundation, of course, on this has been uh, leading the world uh, to rethink the approach to value creation. And uh, as we all know and all we share here today, food is the mother of the challenges that we do have in redesigning 
uh, strategically. So I hope that uh, together also, thanks to the joining of uh, the uh, program that Clementine has been uh, announcing, there will be a champion in the circular food for the future and Intesa San Paolo is proudly engaged in making sure this transition is a systemic one and Italy plays a key role in this transition. So thanks to Bill for organizing such an amazing meeting for us. I believe that uh, uh, we are uh, enormously gifted with uh, uh, the ideas and the ambition that can be shared today. And once again, let's make this transition happen working together. This is truly an amazing collective journey. Thank you very much. to hear a little bit about sure. uh, Hexagrow. Tell us a little bit about the story of Hexagrow and uh, what you are looking to do in the future with your project. And congratulations, by the way, that- uh, Thanks so much. As we sit here. So let's hear a little bit about it. So you already probably heard a lot from the presentation that uh, they just presented about. Uh, we are an indoor farming company, but most of all, we are reconnecting, we are working to reconnect people and nature. We are working bio with biomimicry. We are working with biophilic design to create spaces that are healthier, that can produce and let people to access healthy food anywhere they are. So we're using different technologies and different methods to create our system that are completely modular, created on circular economy approaches. So you can plug and play, make it bigger and make it smaller depending on the farming needs that you have and especially what uh, the space is available for you. And later on, we're gonna work on decentralizing this, these technologies and making available for anyone to participate in the, in the process. So imagine like an Uber-like economy, but for urban farming. I think I won't steal any more of your time. And if you're interested, you can visit us at stand W26 upstairs or just write us an email. So thanks so much. All right, now we bring the Future Food Institute back to the stage. So I don't know if Claudia or one of the partners comes on up here to uh, present the Future Food Award. Excellent. Hi, everyone. I'm Valerio Papalardo. Life is quite strange because last year I applied for the startup uh, initiative for Tech Edition, and now I'm given an award here, so it's pretty funny. So uh, I work with uh, the Innovation and Startups for Future Food Institute, and I will briefly explain why we decided to give this award to this particular startup. So basically, as you might know, between the most important themes and made food system challenges, we have a need for supply control and safety, especially against forgery and counterfeiting. To give you a few numbers, Italian food production alone is able to gain 130 37 billion euros per year from sales, with 40 billions from exports. But the scourge of counterfeiting still costs tens of billions a year, only to made in Italy. When we look at the future of nutrition, we hear every day about integrity, traceability, or blockchain, or food safety. So, we decided to give this award to Wenda. Wenda has been able to do what all the startups in the food system should do, especially in this market. They've been able to listen, readjust, and pivot, studying every client's need to innovate and renew their offer. Between the Mena Solution, that pursue a world of food and constant evolution, they decided to not think about uh, all the normal trends, but they went directly to the customer's needs. So in, today, it's easier to ask them what they're not doing to change and improve the future of food logistics, so we are more than happy to reward them and take them with us in our discovery mission around the world. So we know that they will learn a lot and will put even more to use and thus creating a new value for them and our world. Thank you very much. And this is the award. Thank you. So some words about Wenda. Thank you, startup initiative from Tito San Paolo and Future Food. Thank you very much. So we are an innovative startup uh, which deliver uh, food integrity tracking solution. 
because we uh, are sure and we see in the market that the food do not keep its integrity throughout the supply chain on its way to the consumer. Integrity, quality, shelf life of the product so the, pr the, cons the final consumer can eat something which is unsafety of or uh, of a bad quality. So we created this uh, IoT uh, blockchain solution to track and trace the product and the key parameters which affect the product quality and shelf, shelf life and we will be able to predict the shelf life of the product uh, while, it's, uh, while it is going on its way to the consumer in the supply chain. Thank you. All right, nicely done. Congrats. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you very much. All right, congratulations to both of the winners here today. So from Wenda and Hexagro, we appreciate uh, their efforts here. And uh, from uh, the Ellen MacArthur Foundation, Future Food Institute, and Intesa San Paolo, we know that we're finished up here when uh, the center of the room has already moved to the next presentation, but we appreciate all the input that everybody has done into the app. Of course, we want to take that feedback, deliver it back to the entrepreneurs who presented here today so they have a chance to learn from their experience and your uh, opinions of the projects. So we're done here for the uh, Intesa San Paulo startup initiative and from the Innovation Center inside of Intesa San Paulo myself and from Mauro Piloni, who uh, we really appreciate the support and help you had uh, been able to give to the startups, uh, invaluable support, fantastic uh, opportunity for them to learn from the perspective of the acquirer and as well the entrepreneur, uh, what they needed to do to impress their investors. So thank you very much to Mauro. All right, we're done here. Thank you very much to the audience. Move on, have a good evening. Thank you.